I went into my room, which proved to have the same sweeping view of the mountains, the lake, the trees, and the glacier. And it was, if anything, more spectacular than in the lobby, from being higher up. I took off the raincoat and the uniform it had hidden, put on a tracksuit and trainers, and returned to Zack's fray. The crisis was the absence of an actor who was supposed to have arrived, but had sent apologies instead. Apologies! Zack fumed. He broke his goddamn arm this morning, and he's not coming. I ask you, is a broken arm any sort of an excuse? The others, the whole troop, were inclined to think not. He was supposed to be Angelica's husband, Zack said. What about Steve? I asked. He was her lover and their business partner. They were both killed by Giles because they just found out he had embezzled all the capital and the bloodstock business was bankrupt. Now Angelica's husband comes on the scene to ask where her money is, as she hasn't changed her will and he inherits. He decided to investigate her death himself because he doesn't think either the Mounties or I have done a good enough job. And now he isn't even here. Well, I said, why don't you discover that it is Raoul who is really Angelica's husband and who stands to inherit, which gives him a lot of motive as he doesn't know yet that Giles has embezzled the money, does he? No one does. And Raoul is only free to marry Donna because Angelica is dead, which can give the Bricknells hysterics. And how about if Raoul says the Bricknells themselves have been doping their horses, not Raoul? but they deny it and are very pleased that he should be judged guilty of everything. Now they know he can't marry their daughter because he is probably a murderer and will go to jail. And how about if it was the Bricknell's horse that was really supposed to be kidnapped, but by Giles, as you can later discover, so that he could sell it and gain enough to skip the country once he'd got safely to Vancouver? They opened their mouths. I don't know that it actually makes sense. Zack said eventually. Never mind, I don't suppose they'll notice. You cynical son of a... I don't see why not, Donna said. And I can have a nice weepy scene with Pierre. Why? Zack said. I like doing them. They all fell about, and in a while walked through dramatic revelations received by Zack from outside sources of Raoul's marriage to Angelica five years earlier, which neither had acknowledged at Toronto Station because, Raoul said unconvincingly, they were both shocked to find the other there, as he wanted to meld with Donna, as she with Steve. They all went away presently to get into their character clothes, and from Zack very much later I heard that the whole thing played at the tops of their voices had been a galvanic riot. He came to my door with a bottle in each hand, scotch for him, red wine for me, and sank exhaustedly into an armchair, with an air of having nobly borne the weight of the world on his shoulders, and bravely survived. Did you have any dinner? he said, yawning. Ugh, I didn't see you. I had some sent up. He looked at the television program with which I'd passed the time. Rotten reception in these mountains, he said. Look at that idiot, he stared at the screen. Couldn't act his way out of a paper bag. We drank companionably and I asked if the party were all generally happy without Daffodil Quentin. "'The deer in the Mont Blanc curls,' he said. "'Oh, sure, they were all in a great mood. "'That man who used to be with her all the time "'was dripping charm all over Bambi Lorimore, "'and that nutter of a son of hers didn't open his mouth once. "'Those Australians are still in the clouds.' "'He described the reactions of some of the others to the evening scene.' and then said he would rely on me for another scintillating bit of scrambled plot for the next night. Not to mention, he added, a denouement and finale for the night after, our last on the train. The mystery had to be solved then, before a gala dinner of epic proportions, comprising five courses produced by Angus by sleight of hand. But I only said it all off the top of my head, I said. Ah, uh, the top of your head will do us all fine. Ah! <sighs> oh. Tell you the truth. We need a fresh mind. Well, all right. So, how much do I pay you? I was surprised. Oh, I don't want money. Don't be silly. Uh, I said, I do earn more than Tommy. 
He looked at me out of his whiskey glass. You don't really surprise me. So thanks a lot, I said, meaning it, but no thanks. He nodded and left it. The offer, honourably made, realistically declined. Anything he would have paid me would have come directly out of his own pocket. Impossible to accept. Oh, he said, clearly hit by a shaft of memory. Nell asked me to give you this. He dug into a pocket and produced a sealed envelope which he handed over. It said, Nell Richmond on the outside, and photographs do not bend. Thanks, I said, relieved. I was beginning to think it hadn't got here. I opened the envelope and found three identical prints inside, but no letter. The pictures were clear, sharp, and in black and white, owing to the fast, high-definition film I habitually used in the binoculars camera. The subject, taken from above, was looking upwards and to one side, to a point somewhere below the lens, so that one couldn't see his eyes clearly. But the sharply jutting cheekbones, the narrow nose, the deep eye sockets, the angled jawbone, and the hairline retreating from the temples, all were identifiable at a glance. I handed one of the prints to Zack, and he looked at it curiously. Who is it? he said. Now, that's the point. Who is he? Have you seen him on the train? He looked again at the picture, which showed below the head, the shoulders and neck, with the sheepskin collar of the padded jacket over a sweater of some sort, and a checked shirt unbuttoned at the top. Tough-looking man, Zack said. Is he a militant union agitator? I was startled. Why do you say that? Uh, I don't know. He has the look. Oh, intensity and, and aggression. That's what I'd cast him as. And is that how you'd also act a union agitator? Sure, he grinned. If he was described in the script as a troublemaker. He shook his head. No, I haven't seen him on the train or anywhere else that I know of. Is he one of the racegoers, then? I don't know for sure, but he was at Thunder Bay Station and also at Winnipeg Races. Sleeping car attendants will know. I nodded. I'll ask them. What do you want him for? Making trouble. He handed back the photograph with a smile. Typecast, he said, nodding. He ambled off to bed. And early the next morning I telephoned Mrs. Baudelaire, who sounded as if she rose with the lark. I asked her to tell Bill the photos had arrived safely. Oh, good, she said blithely. Did you get my message with the numbers? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Val called with them from London, sounding very pleased. He said he wasn't having so much success with whatever it was that Sheridan Lorimore did at Cambridge. No one's talking. He thinks the gag is cash for the new library being built at Sheridan's old college. How immoral can academics get? And Bill said to tell you that they went round to the Winnipeg barns with that photo, but no one knew who the man was, except that he did go there asking for Lenny Higgs. Bill says they will ask all the Ontario racing people they can reach, and may be printed in the racing papers coast to coast. Great. Bill wants to know what name you're using on the train. I hesitated, which she picked up at once with audible hurt. Don't you trust us? Of course I do. But I don't trust everyone on the train. Oh, I see. You were right to send the message to Nell. Good, then. Are you well? I asked. The line said, Have a nice day, young man, and went dead. I listened to her silence with regret. I should have known better. I did know better. But it seemed discourteous never to ask. With her much in mind, I dressed for outdoors, hopped down the fire stairs, and found an inconspicuous way out so as not to come face to face with any passengers who were en route to breakfast. In my woolly hat well pulled down and my navy zipped jacket, I found a good vantage point for watching the front door, then wandered round a bit and returned to the watching point a little before bus boarding time for the joy trip to Banff. Under the jacket I had slung the binoculars, just in case I could get nowhere near. But in fact, from leaning against the boot of an empty, parked, locked car, where I hoped I looked as if I was waiting for the driver to return, I had a close enough view not to need them. A large, ultra-modern bus with tinted windows rolled in, and stationed itself obligingly so that I could see who walked from the hotel to board it, and very soon after, when the driver had been into the hotel to report his arrival, 
Nell appeared in a warm jacket, trousers, and boots, and shepherded her flock with smiles into its depths. Most of the passengers were going sightseeing, it seemed, but not all. Filmer didn't come out. I willed him to, to appear without his briefcase and roll away for hours, to give me a chance of thinking of some way to get into his room in safety. Willing didn't work. Julius Apollo didn't seem to want to walk on a glacier or dangle in a cable car, and stayed resolutely indoors. Mercer, Bambi and Sheridan came out of the hotel together, hardly looking a light-hearted little family, and inserted themselves into a large waiting chauffeur-driven car which carried them off immediately. No Xanthi. No Xanthi on the bus, either. Rose and Cumber Young had boarded without her. Xanthi, I surmised, was back in the sulks. Nell, making a note on her clipboard and looking at her watch, decided there were no more customers for the bus. She stepped inside it and closed the door, and I watched it roll away. Chapter 15 I walked about on foot in the mountains, thinking of the gifts that had been given me. Lenny Higgs, the combinations of the locks of the briefcase, Nell's friendship, Mrs. Baudelaire, the chance to invent Zack's scripts. It was the last which chiefly filled my mind as I walked round the path which circled the little lake, and the plans I began forming for the script had a lot to do with the end of my conversation with Bill Baudelaire, which had been disturbing. After he'd agreed to arrange a replacement groom for Laurentide Ice, he said he'd tried to talk to Mercer Lorimore at Assiniboia Downs, but hadn't had much success. Talk about what? I asked. About our quarry. I was shocked to find how friendly he had become with the Larimores. I tried to draw Mercer Larimore aside and remind him about the trial, but he was quite short with me. If a man was found innocent, he said that was an end of it. He thinks good of everyone, it seems, which is saintly but not sensible. Bill's voice went even deeper with disillusion. Our quarry can be overpoweringly pleasant, you know, if he puts his mind to it, and he had certainly been doing that. He had poor Daffodil Quentin practically eating out of his hand, too, and I wonder what she thinks of him now. I could hear the echo of his voice in the mountains. More saintly than sensible. Mercer was a man who saw good where no good existed, who longed for goodness in his son and would pay forever because it couldn't be achieved. The path round the lake wound uphill and down, sometimes through close thronging pines, sometimes with sudden breath-stopping views of the silent giants towering above, sometimes with clear vistas of the deep turquoise water below in its perfect bowl. It had rained during the night, so that the whole scene in the morning sunshine looked washed and glittering, and the rain had fallen as snow on the mountain tops and the glacier, which now appeared whiter, cleaner, and nearer than the day before. The air was cold, descending perceptibly like a tide from the frozen peaks, but the sun, at its autumn highest in the sky, still kept enough warmth to make walking a pleasure, and when I came to a place where a bench had been placed before a stunning panorama of lake, the chateau and the mountain behind it, it was warm enough also to pause and sit down. I brushed some raindrops off the seat and slouched on the bench, hands in pockets, gazed vaguely on the picture-postcard spectacle, mind in second gear on Filmer. I could see figures walking about by the shore in the chateau garden, and thought without hurry of perhaps bringing out the binoculars to see if any of them was Julius Apollo. Not that it would have been of much help, I supposed, if he'd been there. He wouldn't be doing anything usefully criminal under the gaze of the chateau's serried ranks of windows. Someone with quiet footsteps came along the path from the shelter of the trees and stopped, looking down at the lake. Someone female. I glanced at her incuriously, seeing a back view of jeans, blue parka, white trainers, and a white woolen hat with two scarlet pom-poms. And then she turned round, and I saw that it was Xanthi Lorimore. She looked disappointed to find the bench already occupied. Do you mind if I sit here? she said. It's a long walk. My legs are tired. No, of course not. I stood up and brushed the raindrops off the rest of the bench, making a drier space for her. Thanks. 
she flopped down in adolescent gawkiness, and I took my own place again with a couple of feet between us. She frowned. Haven't I seen you before? she asked. Are you on the train? Yes, miss, I said, knowing that there was no point in denying it, as she would see me again and more clearly in the dining room. I'm one of the crew. Oh! She began as if automatically to get to her feet, and then, after a moment, decided against it out of tiredness and relaxed. Are you, she said slowly, keeping her distance, one of the waiters? Yes, Miss Lorimore. The one who told me I had to pay for a Coke? Yes, I'm sorry. She shrugged and looked down at the lake. I suppose, she said in a disgruntled voice, all this is pretty special, but what I really feel is bored. She had thick, almost straight chestnut hair, which curved at the ends over her shoulders, and she had clear, fine skin and marvellous eyebrows. She was going to be beautiful, I thought, with maturity, unless she let the sulky cast of her mouth spoil not just her face, but her life. I sometimes wish I was poor like you, she said. It would make everything simple. She glanced at me. I suppose you think I'm crazy to say that, she paused. My mother would say I shouldn't be talking to you anyway. I moved as if to stand up. I'll go away if you like, I said politely. No, don't. She was unexpectedly vehement and surprised even herself. I mean, there's no one else to talk to. I mean, well... I do understand, I said. Do you? She was embarrassed. I was going to go on the bus, really. My parents think I'm on the bus. I was going with Rose, Mrs. Young, and, and Mr. Young, but he... She almost stopped but the childish urge in her to talk was again running strong, sweeping away discretion. He's never as nice to me as she is. I think he's tired of me. Cumber. Isn't that a stupid name? It's Cumberland, really. That's somewhere in England where his parents went on their honeymoon, Rose says. Albert Cumberland Young. That's what his name is. Rose started calling him Cumber when they met because she thought it sounded cosier, but he isn't cosy at all, you know. He's stiff and stern. She broke off and looked down towards the chateau. Why do all those Japanese go on their honeymoons together? I don't know, I said. Perhaps they'll all call their children Lake Louise. They could do worse. What's your name? she asked. Tommy, Miss Lorimore. She made no comment. She was only half easy in my company, too conscious of my job. But, above all, she wanted to talk. "'You know my brother, Sheridan?' she said. I nodded. "'The trouble with Sheridan is that we're too rich. He thinks he's better than everyone else because he's richer.' She paused. "'What do you think of that?' It was part a challenge, part a desperate question, and I answered her from my own heart. "'I think it's very difficult to be very rich, very young.' Do you, really? She was surprised. It's what everyone wants to be. If you can have everything, you forget what it's like to need. And if you're given everything, you never learn to save. She brushed that aside. There was no point in saving. My grandmother left me millions, and Sheridan, too. I suppose you think that's awful. He thinks he deserves it. He thinks he can do anything he likes because he's rich. You could give it away, I said, if you think it's awful. Would you? I said regretfully. No. Well, there you are, then. I'd give some of it away. I've got trustees, and they won't let me. I smiled faintly. I'd had Clement Cornborough. Trustees, he told me once austerely, were there to preserve and increase fortunes, not to allow them to be squandered. And no, he wouldn't allow a fifteen-year-old boy to fund a farm for pensioned-off racehorses. Why do you think it's difficult to be rich? she demanded. It's easy, I said neutrally. You said just now that if you were poor, life would be simple. I suppose I did. I suppose I didn't mean it, or not really. I don't know if I meant it. Why is it difficult to be rich? Too much temptation. Too many available corruptions. 
Do you mean drugs? Anything. Too many pairs of shoes. Self-importance. She put her feet up on the bench and hugged her knees, looking at me over the top. No one will believe this conversation. She paused. Do you wish you were rich? It was an unanswerable question. I said truthfully in evasion, oh, I, I wouldn't like to be starving. My father says, she announced, that one's not better because one's richer, but richer because one's better. Mm, neat. He always says things like that. I don't understand them sometimes. Your brother Sheridan, I said cautiously, doesn't seem to be happy. Happy? She was scornful. He's never happy. I've hardly seen him happy in his whole life, except that he does laugh at people sometimes. She was doubtful. I suppose if he laughs, he must be happy. Only he despises them, that's why he laughs. I wish I liked Sheridan. I wish I had a terrific brother who would look after me and take me places. That would be fun. Only it wouldn't be with Sheridan, of course, because it would end in trouble. He's been terrible on this trip. Much worse than usual. I mean, he's embarrassing. She frowned, disliking her thoughts. Someone said, I said, without any of my deep curiosity showing, that he had a bit of trouble in England. Bit of trouble? I shouldn't tell you, but he ought to be in jail. Only they didn't press charges. I think my father bought them off. And anyway, that's why Sheridan does what my parents say right now, because they threaten to let him be prosecuted if he as much as squeaks. Could he still be prosecuted? I asked without emphasis. What's a statute of limitations? A time limit, I said, after which one cannot be had up for a particular bit of law-breaking. In England? Yes. You're English, aren't you? she asked. Yes. He said, Hold your breath. The statute of limitations is out of sight. Who, who said? An attorney, I think. What did he mean? Did he mean that Sheridan is... 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 Vulnerable? She nodded. Forever? Maybe for a long time. Twenty years? An unimaginable time, her voice said. It would have to have been bad. I don't know what he did, she said despairingly. I only know it's ruined this summer, absolutely ruined it. And I'm supposed to be in school right now, only they made me come on this train because they wouldn't leave me in the house alone. Well, not alone, but alone except for the servants. And that's because my cousin Susan Lorimore, back in the summer, she's seventeen, she ran off with their chauffeur's son, and they got married, and there was an earthquake in the family. And I can see why she did. They kept leaving her alone in that huge house and going to Europe, and she was bored out of her skull. And anyway, it seems their chauffeur's son is all brains, and cute, too. And she sent me a card saying she didn't regret a thing. My mother is scared to death that I'll run off with some... She stopped abruptly, looked at me a little wildly, and sprang to her feet. I forgot, she said. I, I sort of forgot you're... It's all right, I said, standing also. Really, all right. I guess I talk too much. She was worried and unsure. You, you won't... No, not a word. Cumber told me I ought to mind my tongue, she said resentfully. He doesn't know what it's like living in a mausoleum, with everyone glowering at each other and Daddy trying to smile. She swallowed. What would you do? she demanded. If you were me? Make your father laugh. She was puzzled. Do you mean make him happy? He needs your love, I said. I gestured to the path back to the chateau. If you'd like to go on first, I'll follow after. Come with me, she said. No, better not. In an emotional muddle that I hadn't much helped, she tentatively set off, looking back twice until a bend in the path took her out of sight. And I sat down again on the bench, although growing cold now, and thought about what she'd said, and felt grateful, as ever and always, for Aunt Viv. 
There wasn't much wrong with Xanthi, I thought. Lonely, worried, only half understanding the adult world, needing reassurance, she longed primarily for exactly what Mercer himself wanted, a friendly, united family. She hadn't thought of affronting her parents by cuddling up to a waiter, very much the reverse. She hadn't tried to put me into a difficult position, had been without guile or tricks. I wouldn't have minded having a younger sister like her, that I could take places for her to have fun. I hoped she would learn to live in peace with her money, and thought that a month or so of serving other people in a good crew like Emile, Oliver and Cathy would be the best education she could get. After a while, I scanned the whole chateau and its gardens with the binoculars, but I couldn't see Filmer, which wasn't really surprising. And in the end, I set off again to walk, and detoured up onto the foot of the glacier, trudging on the cracked, crunchy, grey-brown-green fringe of the frozen river. Laurentide Ice, one of the passengers had knowledgeably said early on, was the name given to one of the last great polar ice sheets to cover most of Canada twenty thousand years before. Daffodil, nodding, had said her husband had named the horse because he was interested in prehistory, and she was going to call her next horse Cordilleran Ice, the sheet that had covered the Rockies. Her husband would have been pleased, she said. I could be standing at that moment on prehistoric Cordilleran ice, perhaps, I thought. But if glaciers move faster than history, perhaps not. Anyway, it gave a certain perspective to the concerns of Julius Apollo. Back at the chateau, I went upstairs and drafted a new scene for the script, and I'd barely finished when Zack came knocking to inquire for it. We went into his room where the cast had already gathered for the rehearsal, and I looked round at their seven faces and asked if we still had the services of begging Ben, who was missing from the room. No, we didn't, Zack said. He'd gone back to Toronto, did it matter? No, not really. He might have been useful as a messenger, but I expect you could pretend a messenger. They nodded. Right, Zack said, looking at his watch. We're on stage in two and a half hours. What do we do? First, I said, Raoul starts a row with Pierre. Raoul is furious to have been discovered to be Angelica's husband and he says he positively knows Pierre owes thousands in gambling debts which he can't pay, and he knows who he owes it to, and he says that that man is known to beat people up who don't pay. Raoul and Pierre nodded. I'll put in some detail, Raoul said. I'll say the debts are from illegal racing bets, and I've been told because they were on the Bricknell's horses, OK? OK, Zack said to me. Yeah, OK. Then Raoul taunts Pierre that his only chance of getting the money is to marry Donna, and Walter Bricknell says that if Donna is so stupid as to marry Pierre, he will not give her a penny. He will in no circumstances pay Pierre's debts. They all nodded. At that point, Mavis Bricknell comes screaming into the cocktail room, saying that all her beautiful jewels have been stolen. They all literally sat up. Mavis laughed and clapped her hands. Who's stolen them? she said. All in good time, I smiled. Raoul accuses Pierre. Pierre accuses Raoul, and they begin to shove each other around, letting all their mutual hatred hang out. Finally, Zack steps in, breaks it up, and says they will all go and search both Pierre's room and Raoul's room for the jewels. Zack, Raoul, Pierre, and Mavis go off. They nodded. That leaves, I said, Donna, Walter Bricknell, and Giles in the cocktail room. Donna and Walter have another argument about Pierre. Donna stifles a few tears, and then Giles comes out of the audience to support Donna and say she's been having a bad experience, and he thinks it's time for a little good feeling all round. Giles said, OK, good, here we go. Then, I said, Zack and the others return. They haven't found the jewels. Giles begins to comfort Mavis as well. Mavis says she's lived for her collection. She loved every piece. She's distraught. She goes on a bit. Lovely, Mavis said. Walter, I went on, says he can't see any point in jewellery. His jewellery is horses. He lives for his horses. He says extravagantly that if he couldn't go racing to watch his horses, he'd rather die. He'd kill himself if he couldn't have horses. Walter frowned, but eagerly nodded. He hadn't had much of a part so far. It would give him a big scene of his own, even if one difficult to make convincing. 
Walter then says Raoul is ruining his pleasure in his horses, and ruining the journey for everyone, and he gives him the formal sack as his trainer. Raoul protests and says he hasn't deserved to be fired. Walter says Raoul is probably a murderer and a jewel thief, and has been cheating him with his horses. Raoul, in a rage, tries to attack Walter. Zack hauls him off. Zack tells everyone to cool down. He says he will organize a search of everyone's bedrooms to see if the jewels can be found, and he will consult with the hotel's detective and call in the police if necessary. Everyone looks as if they don't want the police. End of scene. I waited for their adverse comments and altering suggestions, but there were very few. I handed my outline to Zack, who went over it again bit by bit with the actors concerned, and they all started murmuring, making up their own words. And what happens tomorrow? Zack asked finally. How do we sort it all out? I, I haven't written it down yet, I said. But do you have it in mind? Could you write it this evening? I nodded twice. Right, he said. We'd better all meet here tomorrow after breakfast. We'll have to do a thorough walk-through, maybe two or even three, to make sure we get it all right. Tie up the loose ends, that sort of thing. And don't forget, everybody, tomorrow we'll be back in the dining car. Not so much room for fighting and so on, so make it full of action tonight. Tomorrow, Pierre gets shot, I said. Oh, boy, oh, boy, Pierre said. But not fatally. You can go on talking. Better and better. But you'll need some blood. Great, Pierre said. How much? Well, I laughed. I'll let you decide where the bullet goes, and how much gore you think the passengers can stand, but you'd better be going to live at the end of it. They wanted to know what else I had in store, but I wouldn't tell them. I said they might give the future away by accident if they knew, and they protested they were too professional to do that. But I didn't altogether trust their improvising tongues, and they shrugged and gave way with fair grace. I watched the walk-through, which seemed to go pretty well. But it was nothing, Zack assured me afterwards, to the actual live performance among the cocktails. He came back to my room at eleven, as on the previous night, drinking well-earned whiskey exhaustedly. Those two, Raoul and Pierre, they really gave it a go, he said. They both learned stage fighting and stunts at drama school, you know. They'd worked out the fight beforehand, and it was a humdinger. All over the place. It was a shame to break it up. Half the passengers spilled their cocktails with Raoul and Pierre rolling and slogging on the floor near their feet, and we had to give everyone free refills. Oh, uh, dear Mavis put on the grand tragedy for reporting the theft of the jewels, and poured on some tremendous pathos later over losing all her happy memories of the gifts that were bound up in them. Oh, oh, oh. Ha, had half the audience in tears. Marvelous. Then Walter did his thing quite well, considering he complained to me that no one in their right mind would kill themselves because they couldn't go racing. And afterwards, would you believe it, one of the passengers asked me where we got the idea from, about someone killing themselves because they couldn't go racing. What did you say? I asked with a jerk of anxiety. I said I picked it out of the air. He watched me relax a shade and asked, Where did you get it from? I knew of someone not long ago who did just that. Thirteen days ago, a lifetime. Crazy! Hmm. I paused. Who asked you? Oh, can't remember. He thought. It might have been Mr. Young? Indeed it might, I thought. Ezra Gideon had been his friend. It might have been Filmer. Ezra Gideon had been his victim. Are you sure? I asked. He thought some more. Yup, Mr. Young. He was sitting with that sweet wife of his, and he got up and came across the room to ask. I drank some wine and said conversationally, Did anyone else react? Zack's attention, never far below the surface, came to an intuitive point. Do I detect? He said, A hint of Hamlet? How do you mean? I asked, although I knew exactly what he meant. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Right? Is that what you were up to? In a mild way. And tomorrow? Tomorrow, too, I agreed. He said broodingly, You're not going to get any of us into trouble, are you? 
I am not sued for slander or anything. Uh -huh. No, I promise not. Perhaps I shouldn't let you write tomorrow's script. Well, you must do what you think best. I picked the finished script off the table beside me and stretched forward to hand it to him. Read it first, then decide. Okay. He put his glass down and began reading. He read to the end and finally raised a smiling face. It's great, he said. All my original ideas with yours on top. Good. I was much relieved that he liked it and thought him generous. Where's the Hamlet bit? he asked. In loving not wisely but too well. That's Othello. Oh, sorry. He thought it over. It seems harmless enough to me, but all I want to do, I said, is open a few specific eyes. Warn a couple of people about the path they're treading. I can't, you see, just walk up to them and say it, can I? They wouldn't take it from Tommy. They probably wouldn't take it from anybody. But if they see something acted, they can learn from it. Like Hamlet's mother? Yes. He sipped his whiskey. Who do you want to warn about what? He said. Better I don't tell you. Then nothing's your fault. What are you really on the train for? He asked, frowning. You know what? To keep everyone happy and foil the wicked. And this scene will help? I hope so. All right. He made up his mind. I don't object to foiling the wicked. We'll give it our best shot. He grinned suddenly. The others will love the Hamlet angle. I was alarmed. No, please don't tell them. Oh, why ever not? I want the passengers to think that any similarity of the plot to their own lives is purely coincidental. I don't want the actors telling them afterwards that it was all deliberate. He smiled twistedly. Are we back to slander? No, there's no risk of that. It's just... Uh, I don't want them identifying me as the one who knows so much about them. If anyone asks the actors where the plot came from, I'd far rather they said it was you. Hmm, and dump me in the shit. He was good-humoured, however. No one could have suspicions about you, I smiled faintly. Apart from foiling villainy, success for me means hiding behind Tommy to the end and getting off the train unexposed. Are you... are you some sort of spy? Uh, a security guard, that's all. Can I put you in my next plot? In my next train mystery? <laughs> Be my guest. He laughed, yawned, put down his glass and stood up. Well, pal, whoever you are, he said, it's been an education knowing you. Nell telephoned to my room at seven in the morning. Are you awake? she said. Wide. It snowed again in the night. The mountains are white. I could see them, I said, from my bed. Do you sleep with your curtains open? Always, do you? Yes. Are you dressed? I asked. Yes, I am. What's that to do with anything? With defences, even over the telephone. I hate you. One can't have everything. Listen, she said severely, smothering a laugh. Be sensible. I phoned to ask if you wanted to walk down again to the station this afternoon when we board the train, or go down on the crew bus. I reflected. On the bus, I should think. Okay. That bus goes from outside the staff annex at 3.35. Take your bag with you. All right. Thanks. The whole train, with the horses and racegoers and everything, comes up from Banff to arrive at Lake Louise Station at 4.15. That gives the passengers plenty of time to board and go to their bedrooms again and begin to unpack comfortably before we leave Lake Louise on the dot of 4.35. The regular Canadian comes along behind us as before and leaves Lake Louise at 10 past 5. So we have to make sure everyone is boarded early so that our train can leave right on time. Understood. I'm going to tell all this to the passengers at breakfast, and also that at 5.30 we're serving champagne and canapes to everyone in the dining car, and at 6 we'll have the solution to the mystery, and after that, cocktails for those who want them, and then the gala banquet. Then the actors return for photos and post-mortems over cognac. It all sounds like hell. I laughed. It will all work beautifully. I'm going into a nunnery after this. There are better places. 
Where, for instance? Hawaii? There was a sudden silence on the line. Then she said, I have to be back at my desk. We could take the desk, too, she giggled. I'll find out about shipment. Done, then? No. I, I don't know. I'll let you know in Vancouver. Vancouver, I said, is tomorrow morning. After the race, then. And before the red-eye special. Do you ever give up? It depends, I said, on the signals. Chapter 16 Filmer clung closely to his briefcase during the transit from chateau to train at Lake Louise, although he had allowed his larger suitcase to be brought down with everyone else's to be arranged side by side in a long line at the station, waiting to be lifted aboard by porters. From among the bunch of crew members, Emile, Oliver, Cathy, Angus, Simon, the barman and the sleeping car attendants, I watched Filmer and most of the passengers disembark from the bus and check that their bags were in the line-up. The Lorimores, arriving separately with their chauffeur, brought their cases with them, the chauffeur stacking them in an aloof little group. A freight train clanked by, seemingly endless. A hundred and two grain cars, Cathy said, counting. A whole lot of bread. I thought about Mrs. Baudelaire, to whom I'd been talking just before leaving the chateau. Bill said to tell you, she said, that Lenny Higgs did turn to jelly and is being safely taken care of, and a new groom has been engaged for Laurentide Ice with the approval by telephone of his trainer. They told the trainer that Lenny Higgs had done a bunk. Bill has left Winnipeg and has come back to Toronto. He says he's been consulting with the colonel as a matter of urgency, and they agree that Bill will see Mrs. Daffodil Quentin as soon as possible. Does that all make sense? Indeed it does, I said fervently. Good, then. Is Bill still going to Vancouver? I asked. Oh, yes, I think so. Monday evening, I believe, ready for the race on Tuesday. He said he'd be back here again on Wednesday. All these time changes can't be good for anybody. Canada is so huge. 5,514 kilometers from side to side, she said primly. I laughed. Try me in miles. You'll have to do your own sums, young man. I did them later out of curiosity. Three thousand four hundred and twenty-six miles and a quarter. She asked if I had any more questions, but I couldn't think of any, and I said I'd talk to her again from Vancouver in the morning. Sleep well, she said cheerfully. You too. Yes. There was reservation in her voice, and I realized that she probably never slept well herself. Sweet dreams, then, I said. Much easier. Good night. She gave me no time, as usual, to answer. The train hooted in the distance, one of the most haunting of seductive sounds to a wanderer, that and the hollow, breathy boom of departing ships. If I had any addiction, it was to the setting off, not the arrival. Headlights bright in the ripening afternoon sunlight, the huge yellow-fronted engine slowed into the station with muted thunder. One of the engineers as he passed us looking down from his open window. The engineers were the only crew that hadn't come the whole way from Toronto, each stretch of track having its own specialists. There being no sidings at Lake Louise, the abbreviated train that had brought us there had been returned to Banff for the two mountain days, with George Burley going with it in charge. He returned now with the whole train, his cheerful round figure climbing down in the station and greeting the passengers like long-lost friends. With a visible lifting of spirits and freshening enjoyment, the whole party returned upwards to their familiar quarters, the Lorimores, a glum quartet, stepping onto their private railed platform entrance at the very rear of everything, being the only sad note. Nell went along to speak to them, to try to cheer them up. Mercer stopped, answered, smiled. The others simply went on inside. Now, why bother with them, I thought. One would get no thanks. Yet one would always bother somehow for Mercer, the blind saint. Filmer boarded through the open door at the end of his sleeping car, and through his window I saw him moving about in his room, hanging up jackets, washing his hands. Ordinary things. 
What made one man good, I wondered, and another man bad? One man seek to build, the other to frighten and destroy. The acid irony was that the bad might feel more satisfied and fulfilled than the good. I walked along to the car where my roomette was, dumped my bag there, and took off my raincoat to reveal the familiar livery beneath. Only one more night of Tommy, one dinner, one breakfast. Pity, I thought. I'd been getting quite fond of him. George came swinging aboard as the train moved off in its quiet way, and he greeted me with a pleased chuckle. Oh, ho, 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 ho. we're lucky to have heat on this train, eh? he said. Why? I asked. It's very warm. They couldn't start the boiler. He seemed to think it a great joke. You know why? I shook my head. No fuel. I looked blank. Well, they could surely fill up. You bet your life, he said. Only the tank had been filled two days ago, eh, when we went down to Banff, or was supposed to have been. So we had a look, and there were a few drips trickling from the bottom drain, which is only open for sluicing through the tank, which isn't done often, eh? He looked at me expectantly, his eyes bright. Someone stole the fuel? He chuckled. <laughs> Either stole it from the tank, or never loaded it in the first place, and opened the drain to be misleading. Was there a lot of oil on the ground? I asked. Not a bad detective, are you? Yes, there was. Well, what do you think, then? I think they never loaded the right amount, probably just enough to get us a fair way out of Lake Louise, and then they opened the drain a bit to persuade us the fuel had run away by accident along the track, eh? Ha-ha! <laughs> Only they got it wrong. Opened the drain too much. <laughs> the laugh vibrated in his throat. What a fuss, eh? If the train went cold in the mountains, the horses would freeze. What a panic! You don't seem too worried. Why, it didn't happen, did it? No, I guess it didn't. We could have filled the tank again at Revelstoke anyway, he said. It would have ruined this gala banquet of yours, eh? But no one would have died. Doubt if they'd even have got frostbite, not like they might in January. The air temperature up here will fall below zero after sunset soon, but the track goes through the valleys, not up the peaks, eh? And, and there'd be no wind chill factor inside the cars. Very uncomfortable, though. Very. His eyes gleamed. <laughs> I left them all buzzing around like a wasp's nest in Banff, trying to find out who did it. I wasn't as insouciant as he was. I said, Is there anything else that can go wrong with this train? Is there, for instance, any water in the boiler? Never you mind, he said comfortingly. We checked the water. The top tap ran. That tank's full, just as it should be. The boiler won't blow up. And what about the engine? We checked every inch of everything, eh? But it was just some greedy, ordinary crook stealing that oil. Like the ordinary crook who unhitched the Lorimore's car? He thought it over skeptically. Well, I'll grant you that this particular train might attract psychos, as the publicity would be that much greater and more pleasing to them. But there is no visible connection between the two things. He chuckled. People will steal anything, not just oil. Someone stole eight of those blue leather chairs in the dining car once, drove up to the dining car while it was standing unused in the sidings at Mimico in Toronto, drove up in a van saying furniture repairs on the side, and simply loaded up eight good chairs, eh? Oh, oh, oh. last that was ever seen of them. He turned away towards the paperwork spread out on his table, and I left him to go along to the dining car. But I'd taken only two paces when I remembered Gaunt Face, and I fetched his photograph and went back to George. Who, who, who is he? he asked, frowning slightly. Mm, yes, I, I'd say he might be on the train. He, 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 he was down in Banff in the, in the sidings. He thought, trying to remember. It's afternoon, eh? he exclaimed suddenly. That's it, while they were joining up the train. See, the horses had come from Calgary this morning, as the first car of a, of a freight train. They dropped the horse car in the sidings. Then our engine picked up the horse car, and then the racecoers' cars. He concentrated. This man, he was down on the ground, rapping on the horse car door with a stick. 
And when the dragon lady came to the door and asked what he wanted, he said he had a message for the groom looking after the gray horse. So the, the dragon lady told him to wait, and she came back with the groom, only he said he wasn't the right groom. Uh, and, and, and he, the, the groom, eh, said the other groom had left in Calgary, and he'd taken over. And then your man in the photo walked off. I didn't see where he went to. I, I mean, it, it wasn't important. I sighed. Did the man look angry or anything? Oh, I didn't notice. I, I was there to ask Miss Brown if everything was in order in the horse car before we set off, and she said it was. She said all the grooms were in the horse car with their horses, looking after them as they had been all day, and they'd stay there until after we left. She looks after the horses well, eh? And the grooms, too. Can't fault her, eh? No. He held out the photograph for me to take back, but I told him to keep it, and asked diffidently if he would check with the race girl's sleeping car attendants, if he had time, to find out for sure whether or not Gauntface had come all the way from Toronto among the passengers. Oh, what's he done? Anything yet? Frightened a groom into leaving. He stared. Oh, what? Not much of a crime, eh? His eyes laughed. He won't do much jail time for that. I had to agree with him. I left him to his enjoyment of human failures and went towards the dining car, passing as I did so the friendly sleeping car attendant, who was again resting himself in the corridor, watching the changing perspectives of the snowy giants. I don't see this usually, he said in greeting. I don't usually come further west than Winnipeg. Grand, isn't it? I agreed, indeed it was. What time do you bring the beds down? I asked. Oh, any time after the passengers have all gone along to the dining car. Half of them are in their rooms here now, changing. I've just taken extra towels to two of them. I'll give you a hand with the beds later, if you like. Really? He was surprised and pleased. Oh, that'd be great. If you do your dome car rooms first, I said, then when you come back through the dining car, I'll follow you and we can do these. Oh, you, you don't have to, you know. I'll make a nice change from waiting at table. And you're seen, he said, smiling and understanding. What about that? That comes later, I promised him. Oh, all right, then. Thanks very much. Pleasure, I said, and swung along past Filmer's closed door, through the heavy doors of the cold and drafty join into the heat of the corridor beside the kitchen, and finally to the little lobby between kitchen door and tables, where Emile, Oliver, and Cathy were busy unboxing the champagne flutes. I picked up a cloth and began polishing. The other three smiled. In the hissing heat of the kitchen, Angus and Simon were arguing, Angus having asked Simon to shell a bowl full of hard-boiled eggs, which he refused to do, saying he must do it himself. Emile raised amused eyebrows. She is getting crosser as time goes by. Angus is a genius, and she doesn't like it. Angus, as usual, seeming to have six hands all busy at once, proved to be making dozens of fresh canapés on baking trays ready for ten minutes in a scorching oven. Crab and brie together in thin layers of pastry, he said of one batch, and chicken and tarragon in another, cheese and bacon in a third. Simone stood with her hands on her hips, a hoity-toity tilt to her chin. Angus had begun ignoring her completely, which was making things worse. The passengers, as usual, came to the dining car well before the appointed hour, but seemed perfectly happy just to sit and wait. The theatrical entertainment outside the windows, anyway, claimed all eyes and tongues until the shadows grew long in the valleys, and only the peaks were lit with slowly fading intensity, until they too were extinguished into darkness. Evening came swift and early in the mountains, twilight being a matter of a lingering lightness in the sky night growing upwards from the earth. A real shame, most of the passengers complained to Nell, that the train went through the best scenery in Canada in the dark. Someone in a newspaper, they were saying as I distributed the champagne glasses, had said that it was as if the French kept the lights off in the Louvre in Paris. Nell said she was really sorry. She didn't write the timetables, and she hoped everyone had been able to see a mountain or two at Lake Louise, which everyone had, of course. Most had gone up one, sulphur mountain, to the windy summit, in four-seater glass containers on wires. 
Others had said no way and stayed at the bottom. Filmer, sitting this time with the ultra-rich owners of Ready Hot, was saying pleasantly that, no, he hadn't been on the bus tour. He'd been content to take his exercise in the gym at Lake Louise. Filmer had come into the dining room from the dome car end, not from his bedroom, and he arrived wearing a private smirk which sent uncomfortable shivers along my nerves. Any time Julius Apollo looked as pleased with himself as that, it was sure to mean trouble. The Lorimores arrived in a group and sat together at one table, the offspring both looking mutinous and the parents glum. Xanthi, it was clear, hadn't yet made Mercer laugh. Rose and Cumber Young were with the upper gum tree Unwins, and the Flocati people were with the owners of Wordmaster. It was interesting, I thought, that the owners of the horses tended to be attracted to each other, much as if they belonged to a brotherhood which clung naturally together. Perhaps Filmer had understood that. Perhaps it was why he had made such efforts to go on the train as an owner, because being an owner of one of the horses gave him standing, gave him credibility, gave him a power base. If that was what he intended, he had achieved it. Everyone on the train knew Mr. Julius Filmer. Emile popped the champagne corks. Angus whizzed his succulent hot appetizers from oven to serving trays, seeming to summon from nowhere the now peeled and sliced eggs topped with caviar and lemon-skin twists on Melba toast circles. We set off from the kitchen in a small procession, Emile and I pouring the bubbles, Oliver and Cathy doing the skilful stuff with silver serving tongs, giving everyone little platefuls of the hors d'oeuvre they preferred. Nell was laughing at me silently. Well, she would. I kept a totally straight face while filling her glass and also that of Giles, who was sitting beside her in the aisle seat, ready for action. "'Thank you,' Giles said in a bored voice when his glass was full. "'My pleasure, sir,' I said. He nodded. Nell smothered her laughing mouth against her glass, and the people sitting opposite her noticed nothing at all. When I reached the Lorimores, Xanthi was perceptibly anxious. I poured into Bambi's glass and said to Xanthi, for you, miss? She gave me a flicker of a glance. Can I have a Coke? Certainly, miss. I poured champagne for Mercer and for Sheridan, and went back to the kitchen for the Coke. You, ha you, you have to pay for it, Xanthi said jerkily to her father when I returned. Uh, how much? Mercer asked. I told him, and he paid. Thank you, he said. A pleasure, sir. He looked abstracted not his usual placatory self. Xanthi risked another semi-frightened glance at me, and seemed to be greatly reassured when I didn't refer in any way to our encounter above the lake. The most I gave her was the faintest of deferential smiles, which even her mother couldn't have disapproved of if she had seen it. But she, like Mercer, seemed more than usually preoccupied. I went on to the next table, and hoped that Filmer's smirk and Mercer's gloom were not connected although I was afraid that they might be. The smirk had been followed into the dining room by the gloom. When Angus's canapés had been devoured to the last melting morsel and the champagne glasses refilled, Zack arrived with a flourish for the long wrap-up scene. First of all, he said, he had to announce that a thorough search of the rooms in the chateau had produced no sign of Mavis Bricknell's jewels. Commiserations were expressed for Mavis, the passengers entering into the fantasy with zest. Mavis accepted them gratefully. Raoul came bursting into the dining car, furious with Walter Bricknell, who was looking upset enough already. It was too much, Raoul loudly said. It was bad enough Walter firing him as his trainer when he had done nothing to deserve it, but now he had found out that Walter had sent a letter from the chateau to the racing authorities saying his horse calculator wouldn't be running in his Walter's name at Vancouver, and that Raoul wouldn't be credited as trainer. It's unfair, he shouted. I've trained the horse to the minute for that race. I've won five races with him for you. You're cheating me. You're damned ungrateful. I'm going to complain to the jockey club. Walter looked stony. Raoul had another go. Walter said he would do what he liked. Calculator was his. If he wanted to sell it or give it away, that was entirely his business and nobody else's. You said yesterday, Raoul yelled 
that if you didn't have horses, if you couldn't go racing, you'd kill yourself. So, kill yourself. Is that what you're going to do? Everyone looked at Walter in shocked disbelief. Zack invited Walter to explain. Walter said it was none of Zack's business. Everything on the train was his business, Zack said. Could we all please know, he asked Walter, who the new owner of Calculator is going to be? No, no one could ask. Mavis, bewildered, did ask. Walter was rude to her, which no one liked. Walter realized that no one liked it, but he said he couldn't help it. He was getting rid of Calculator, and since the horse was in his name only, not Mavis's, she couldn't do anything about it. Mavis began to cry. Donna went to her mother's defense and verbally attacked her father. You be quiet, he said angrily. You've done enough harm. Pierre put his arm round Donna's shoulders and told Walter not to talk to his daughter that way. He, Pierre, would borrow some money to pay his gambling debts, he said, and really work this time and save until it was paid off, and he would never let Donna take a penny from her father. And when he was out of debt, he and Donna would get married, and there was nothing Walter could do to stop them. Oh, Pierre, Donna wailed and hid her face against his chest. Pierre, in snow-white shirt sleeves, put both arms round her, stroked her hair, and looked very manly, handsome and protective. The audience approved of him with applause. Oh, could he? Cathy said from beside me. Isn't he cute? Yeah, he sure is. We were standing in the little lobby, watching from the shadows, and by a malign quirk of fate, all the faces I was most interested in were sitting with their backs to me. Filmer's neck, not far off, was rigid with tension, and Cumber Young, one table further along, had got compulsively to his feet when Raoul had told Walter to kill himself, and only slowly subsided, with Rose talking to him urgently. Mercer, just over midway along, sitting against the far right-hand side wall, had his head bowed, not watching the action. He couldn't help but hear, however. The actors were all courting laryngitis, making sure that those in the furthest corners weren't left out. Mavis had a go at Walter, first angry, then pleading, then saying she might as well leave him. She obviously didn't count with him any more. She prepared to go. Walter, stung beyond bearing, muttered something to her that stopped her dead. What? she said. Walter muttered again. He says he's being blackmailed, Mavis said in a high voice. How can anyone blackmail someone into getting rid of a horse? Filmer, pinned against the left-hand wall by the unwinds in the aisle seats, sat as if with a rod up his backbone. Mercer turned his head to stare at Walter. Mercer had his back towards Filmer, and I wondered whether he'd sat that way round on purpose, so as not to see his recent friend. He was sitting beside Sheridan and opposite Bambi. Xanthi sat opposite her brother, both in aisle seats. I could see both of the female faces where I wanted to see the male. I would have done better, I suppose, to have watched from the far end. But on the other hand, they might have seen me watching, watching them instead of the action. Walter, under pressure, said loudly that, yes, he was being blackmailed, and by the very nature of blackmail he couldn't say what about. He categorically refused to discuss it further. He had good and sufficient reasons, and he was angry and upset enough about losing his horse without everyone attacking him. And who was he losing it to? Zack asked. Because whoever's name turned up on the race card at Vancouver as the owner, he or she would be the blackmailer. Heads nodded. Walter said it wasn't so. The blackmailer had just said he must give the horse away. Ah, who to? Zack asked insistently. Tell us. We'll soon know. We'll know at the races on Tuesday. Walter, defeated, said, I'm, I'm giving the horse to Giles. General consternation followed. Mavis objected. Giles was a very nice, comforting fellow, but they hardly knew him, she said. Raoul said bitterly that Walter should have given him the horse. He'd worked so hard. Giles said that Walter had asked him, Giles, to have the horse, and of course he'd said yes. After the race on Tuesday, he would decide Calculator's future. Walter looked stony. Giles was being frightfully nice. Donna suddenly detached herself from Pierre and said rather wildly, No, Daddy, I won't let you do it. I understand what's happening. I won't let it happen. Walter told her thunderously to shut up. Donna wouldn't be stopped. 
It was her fault that her father was being blackmailed, and she wouldn't let him give his horse away. Be quiet, Walter ordered. I stole mother's jewels, she said miserably to everyone. I stole them to pay Pierre's debts. They said he would be beaten up if he didn't pay. Those jewels were going to be mine anyway one day. They're in mother's will. So I was only stealing from myself, really, but then he guessed. Who guessed? Zack demanded. Giles, she said. He saw me coming out of mother's room. I suppose I looked scared, maybe guilty. I had her jewels in a tote bag. I suppose it was afterwards, when mother came to say someone had stolen them, that he guessed. He made me give them to him. He said he'd have me arrested otherwise, and my parents wouldn't like that. Stop him! Zack yelled peremptorily as Giles made a dash for the lobby, and Raoul, a big fellow, intercepted him and twisted his arm up behind his back. Giles displayed pain. Zack invited Walter to talk. Walter, distressed, said that Giles had threatened to prove publicly that Donna had stolen the jewels if Walter wouldn't give him the horse. Even if Walter refused to press charges against his daughter, Giles had said, everyone would know she was a thief. Walter confessed that Giles had said, What is one horse against your daughter's reputation? Walter thought he'd had no choice. Donna wept. Mavis wept. Half the audience wept. Filmer was rigid. Also Mercer, Bambi, and Sheridan, all unmoving in their seats. It wasn't sensible to love your daughter so much. Raoul said. She stole the jewels. You shouldn't cover up for her. Look where it got you, into the hands of a blackmailer, and losing the horse you love. And did you think it would stop there with just one horse? You've got two more in my care, don't forget. Stop it, Mavis said, defending Walter now. He's a wonderful man to give up his dearest possession to save his daughter. He's a fool, Raoul said. During this bit, Zack came to the lobby as if to receive a message, and went back into the centre of the dining car, opening an envelope and reading the contents. He said the letter was from Ben, who had begged for money. Did they remember? They remembered. Ben, Zack said, had run away off the train because he was frightened, but he had left this letter to be opened after he'd gone. Zack read the letter portentously, aloud. I know who killed Ricky. I know who threw him off the train. Ricky told me... He knew who killed that lady, Angelica, someone. Ricky saw the murderer with a lot of plastic rolled into a ball. He didn't know he was a murderer then, like. This man came up the train into the part where the grooms are, and he was in the joint part between two sleeping cars, and he pushed the plastic out through one of the gaps until it fell from the train, and then he saw Ricky looking at him. Ricky didn't think much of it until we were told about Angelica, someone, and the plastic with her blood on, and then he was afraid and told me. And then he was thrown off the train. I know who it was. I knew who must have did it. But I wasn't saying. I didn't want to end up dead beside the railway tracks. But now I'm safe out of here, I'll tell you. And it's that good-looking one they was calling Giles on Toronto Station. I saw him there, too, same as Ricky. It was him. Zack stopped reading, and Giles, struggling in Raoul's grip, shouted that it was rubbish, lies, all made up. Raoul showed signs of breaking Giles' arm on account of him having killed Angelica, who was his wife, even if they had separated. How could a groom like Ben make up anything like this? Zack said, waving the note. He said it was time someone searched Giles' room on the train for the jewels, and for anything else incriminating. You've no right. You've no search warrant. And this man is breaking my arm. You murdered his wife, what do you expect? Zack said. And I don't need a search warrant. I'm chief of the railway detectives, don't forget. On trains, I investigate and search where I like. He marched off past me and went swaying down the corridor, pausing down at the end of the kitchen wall where he'd left a sports bag full of props, and soon came marching back. The other actors, meanwhile, had been emoting in character over the disclosure of Giles as murderer as well as blackmailer. Zack took the sports bag, it seemed to me by accident, to the table across from the Lorimores. The people sitting at the table cleared the glasses and empty plates into a stack, and Zack, dumping the bag on the pink cloth, unfastened a few zips. 
To no one's surprise, he produced the jewels. Mavis was reunited with them, with joy slightly dampened by knowing who had stolen them. Reproachful looks, and so on. Zack then discovered a folder of papers. Aha! he said. Giles struggled to no avail. Zack said, Here we have the motive for Angelica's murder. Here's a letter to Giles from Steve, Angelica's lover and business partner, complaining accusingly that he has been checking up, and Giles, in his capacity of bloodstock agent, has not bought the horses that he says he has, that Angelica and Steve have given him the money for. Steve is saying that unless Giles comes up with a very good explanation, he is going to the police. Lies! Giles shouted. It's all here! Zack waved the letter, which everyone later inspected, along with Ben's note. They were accurately written. Zack's props were thorough. Giles embezzled Angelica and Steve's money, he said. And when they threatened him with disgrace, he killed them. Then he killed the groom, who knew too much. Then he blackmailed Walter Bricknell, who was too fond of his daughter. This man, Giles, is beneath contempt. I will get the conductor of the train to arrange for him to be arrested and taken away in Revelstoke, where we stop in two hours. He walked towards the lobby again. Giles, finally breaking free of Raoul, snatched a gun that Zack was wearing in a holster on his hip and waved it about. Zack warned, Put it down. This gun is loaded. Giles shouted at Donna, It's all your fault. You shouldn't have confessed. You spoil it all, and I'll spoil you. He pointed the gun at Donna. Pierre leapt in front of her to save her. Giles shot Pierre, who had, it transpired, chosen a romantic shoulder for the affected part. He clapped a hand to his snow-white shirt, which suddenly blossomed bright red. He fell artistically. The audience truly gasped. Donna knelt frantically beside Pierre, having a grand dramatic time. Giles tried to escape and was subdued none too gently by Zack and Raoul. George Burley appeared on the scene, chuckling non-stop, waving a pair of stage handcuffs. As Zack later said, it was a riot. Chapter 17 Emile said there was enough champagne for everyone to have half a glass more. So he and I went around pouring while Oliver and Cathy cleared the hors d'oeuvre plates, straightened the cloths, and began setting the places for the banquet. I glanced very briefly at Filmer. He looked exceedingly pale, with sweat on his forehead. One hand lying on the tablecloth was tightly clenched. Beside him, the ready hots were enthusing over Zack, who was standing beside their table, agreeing that Pierre was a redeemable character who would make good. Zack gave me a smile and stepped to one side to let me fill the ready hots' glasses. Filmer said, in a harsh, croaking voice, Where did you get that story? As if accepting a compliment, Zack answered, Made it up. You must have got it from somewhere. He was positive and angry. The Reddy Hots looked at him in surprise. I always make them up, Zack said lightly. Why, didn't you enjoy it? Champagne, sir, I said to Filmer. I'd grown very bold, I thought. Filmer didn't hear. Mrs. Reddy Hot passed me his glass, which I replenished. She passed it back. He didn't notice. I thought it a great story, she said. What a wicked, revolting murderer! And he was so nice all along. I stepped around Zack with a glimmer of eye contact in which I gave him my devout thanks for his discretion, and he accepted them with amusement. At the next table, Rose Young was protesting to Cumber that it had to have been a coincidence about committing suicide after getting rid of your best horse. And Ezra had sold his horse, she said not given it away because he was being blackmailed. How do we know he wasn't? Cumber demanded. The Unwins were listening open-mouthed. I filled all their glasses quietly, unnoticed in their general preoccupation. Who now has Ezra's horses? That's what I want to know, Cumber said truculently. And it'll be easy enough to find out. He spoke loudly. Loud enough, I thought, for Filmer to hear him, if he were listening. Emile had beaten me to it with the Lorimores, but they made a remarkable picture. Mercer's forearms rested on the table as he sat with his head bowed. Bambi, a glitter of tears in the frosty eyes, stretched out a hand, 
closed it over one of Mercer's fists, and stroked his knuckles with comforting affection. Xanthi was saying anxiously, w What's the matter with everybody? And Sheridan looked blank, not supercilious, not arrogant, not even alarmed, a wiped blank slate. There were a good many people in the aisle, not only the service crew, but also the actors, who, still in character, were finishing off the drama in the ways they felt happy with. Walter and Mavis, for instance, agreeing that Pierre had saved Donna's life and couldn't be all bad, and maybe he would marry Donna if he stopped gambling. Threading his way through all this came the sleeping car attendant on his way to do the bunks in the dome car. He nodded to me with a smile as he passed, and I nodded back and I thought that my main problem would probably be that the play had been all too successful, and that the people most upset by it wouldn't stay sitting down for dinner. I wandered back to the kitchen where Angus's octopus act was reaching new heights, and hoped especially that Filmer's physical reactions wouldn't get him restlessly to his feet and force him to leave. He didn't move. The rigidity in his body very slowly relaxed. The impact of the play seemed to be lessening and perhaps he really believed that Zack had made it all up. I set the two tables nearest to the kitchen, automatically folded the napkins, and arranged knives and forks. The sleeping car attendant came back eventually from the dome car, and I left my place settings unfinished and followed him. Are you sure? he asked over his shoulder. They seem pretty busy in the dining car. It's a good time, I assured him. Fifteen minutes to dinner. How about if I start from this end, then I'll just stop and go back if I feel guilty. Right, he said. Do you remember how to fold the chairs? He knocked on Filmer's door. The people are all along there in the dining car, but knock first, just in case, he said. Okay. We went into Filmer's room. Fold the chair while I'm here, so I can help you if you need it. Okay. I folded a shade slowly, Julius Apollo's armchair. The sleeping car attendant gave me a pat on the shoulder and left, saying he would start from the far end, as he usually did, and we might meet in the middle. And thanks a lot, he said. I waved a hand. The thanks, did he but know it, were all mine. I left the door open and pulled Filmer's bed down into the night position, smoothing the bottom sheet, folding down a corner of the top sheet, as I'd been shown. I groped into Filmer's wardrobe space, gripped the black crocodile briefcase, and rested it on the bed. Zero, four, nine, one, five, one. My fingers trembled with the compulsion for speed. I aligned the little wheels, fumbling where I needed precision. Zero, four, nine. Press the catch. Click. One, five, one. Press the catch. Click. The latches were open. I laid the case flat on the bottom sheet, pushing the upper sheet back a little to accommodate it, and I lifted the lid. Heart thumping, breathing stopped. The first thing inside was Filmer's passport. I looked at it briefly, and then more closely, getting my suspended breath back in a jerky sort of silent laugh. The number of Filmer's passport was H049151. Hooray for the brigadier! I laid the passport on the bed, and looked through the other papers without removing them or changing their order. They were mainly a boring lot, all the bump about the train trip, a few newspaper pages about the races, then a newspaper cutting from a Cambridge local paper about the building of a new library in one of the colleges, thanks to the generosity of Canadian philanthropist Mercer P. Lorimore. My God, I thought. Beneath the clipping was a letter, a photocopy of a letter. I read it at breakneck speed, feeling danger creep up my spine, feeling my skin flood with heat. It was short, typewritten. There was no address at the top, no date, no salutation, and no signature. It said, As requested, I examined the cadavers of the seven cats found pegged out, eviscerated, and beheaded in the college gardens. I can find nothing except for willful wickedness. These were not cult killings, in my opinion. The cats were killed over a period of perhaps three weeks, the last one yesterday. Each one, except the last, had been hidden under leaves, and had been attacked after death by insects and scavengers. They were all alive when they were pegged out, and during evisceration. Most, if not all, were alive at decapitation. 
I have disposed of the remains as you asked. I could see my hand trembling. I tipped up the next few sheets of paper, which were reports from stockbrokers, and then at the very bottom I came across a small yellow memo sticking to a foolscap-sized paper, headed Conveyance. The memo said, You will have to sign this, not Ivor Horfitz, but I think we can keep it quiet. I looked a shade blankly at the legal words on the deed. All that parcel of land known as SF 90155 on the west side of... and heard the sleeping car attendant's voice coming nearer along the corridor. Tommy, where are you? I flicked the case shut and pushed it under the bed's top sheet. The passport was still in view. I shoved it under the pillow, walked out of the door hastily, and closed it behind me. You've been ages in there, he said, but tolerantly. Couldn't you undo the bed? Uh, manage it finally, I said, dry-mouthed. Right. Well, I, I didn't give you any chocolates. He handed me a box of big silver-wrapped bonbons. Put one on each pillow. Yes, I said. Are you all right? he asked curiously. Oh, yes, it, <laughs> it was hot in the dining car. True. He went back towards his end of the car, unsuspicious. Heart still thumping, I returned to Filmer's room, retrieved his passport from under the pillow, replaced it in the briefcase, shut the locks, twirled the combination wheels, realized I hadn't noticed where they'd been set when I came in, hoped to hell that Filmer didn't set them deliberately, put the case back as I'd found it, straightened the bed, and put the chocolate tidily where it belonged. I went out of the room, closed the door, and walked two paces towards the next door along. Hey, you! Filmer's voice said angrily from close behind me. What were you doing in there? I turned, looked innocent, felt stunned. M making your bed ready for the night, sir. Oh, he shrugged, accepting it. I held the box of sweets towards him. W would you like an extra chocolate, sir? No, I wouldn't, he said, and went abruptly into his bedroom. I felt weak. I waited for him to come out exploding that I'd meddled with his belongings. Nothing, nothing happened. I went into the room next door, folded the armchairs, lowered both beds, turned back the sheets, delivered the sweets, all automatic with a feeling of total unreality. I'd twice come too close to discovery. I had no great taste, I found, for the risks of a spy. I was disturbed, in a way, by my pusillanimity. I supposed I'd never thought much about courage, but taken it for granted, physical courage or physical endurance, anyway. I'd been in hard places in the past, but these risks were different and more difficult, at least for me. I did the third bedroom, by which time the sleeping car attendant, much faster, had almost finished the rest. Thanks a lot, he said cheerfully. Appreciate it. Any time. Did you do your scene? he asked. I nodded. It went fine. Filmer came out of his room and called, Hey, you! The sleeping car attendant went towards him. Yes, sir? Filmer spoke to him, his voice obliterated as far as I was concerned by rail noise, and went back into his room. He's not feeling well, the sleeping car attendant reported, going back towards his own roomette. He asked for something to settle his stomach. Do you have things like that? And acid? Sure. Few simple things. I left him to his mission and went back to the dining car, where Emile greeted me with raised eyebrows and thrust into my hands a trayful of small plates, each bearing a square of pâté de foie gras with a thin slice of black truffle on top. We missed you. You're needed, Emile said. The crackers for the pâté are on the tables. Right. I went ahead with the delivery, going to the Ready Hot's table first. I asked Mrs. Reddyhot if Mr. Filmer would be coming back. Should I put his pâté in his place? She looked a little bewildered. Oh, oh, he didn't say if he was coming back. He went out in a hurry. He trampled on my feet. Leave the pâté, Mr. Reddyhot said. If he doesn't come back, I'll eat it. With a smile, I put some pâté in Filmer's place and went on to the Young's table, where Cumber had stopped talking about Ezra Gideon but looked dour and preoccupied. Rose received her pâté with a smile, 
and made attempts not to let Cumber's moroseness spoil the occasion for the Unwins. Cathy had taken Pate to the Lorimores, who sat in dumb silence, except for Xanthi, who could be heard saying exasperatedly, This is supposed to be a party, for God's sakes! For the rest of the passengers, that was true. The faces were bright, the smiles came easily. The euphoria of the whole journey bonded them in pleasure. It was the last night on the train, and they were determined to make it a good one. Nell was moving down the aisle, handing out mementos. Silver bracelets made of tiny gleaming railway carriages for the women, onyx paperweights set with miniature engines for the men. Charming gifts, received with delight. Xanthi tipped on her bracelet immediately and forgot to look sullen. Emile and I collected the wrapping paper debris. Miss Richmond might have waited until after dinner, Emile said. We served and cleared the rest of the banquet. A salad of sliced yellow tomatoes and fresh basil, a scoop of champagne sorbet, rare roast rib of beef with julienne vegetables, and finally apple snowballs appearing to float on raspberry puree. About six people, including Rose Young, asked how to make the apple snowballs, so I inquired of Angus. He was looking languid and exhausted, but obliging. Tell them it's sieved apple puree, sugar, whipped cream, whipped white of egg. Combine at the last minute. Very simple. Delicious, Rose said when I relayed the information. Do bring out the chef for us to congratulate him. Emile brought out and introduced Angus to prolonged applause. Simon sulked determinedly in the kitchen. Rose Young said they should all thank the rest of the dining car crew, who had worked so hard throughout. Everyone clapped, all most affecting. Xanthi clapped, I noticed. I had great hopes for Xanthi. I managed to stop beside Nell's ear. Xanthi's longing to have a good time, I said. Couldn't you rescue her? Oh, what's the matter with the others? she asked, frowning. Xanthi might tell you if she knows. Nell flashed me an acutely perceptive glance. And you want me to tell you? Yes, please, since you ask. One day you'll explain all this? One day soon. I went back to the kitchen with the others to tackle the mountainous dishwashing and to eat anything left over, which wasn't much. Angus produced a bottle of scotch from a cupboard and drank from it deeply without troubling a glass. Apart from Simon, who had disappeared altogether, there was very good feeling in the kitchen. I wouldn't have missed it, I thought, for a field full of mushrooms. When everything was scoured, polished, and put away, we left Angus unbelievably beginning to make breads for breakfast. I stood in the lobby for a while, watching the dining car slowly clear as everyone drifted off to the dome car lounge for laughter and music. The Lorimores had all gone, and so had Nell and the Unwins and the Youngs. Out of habit I began to collect with Oliver the used napkins and tablecloths, ready to put out clean ones for breakfast, and presently Nell came back and sat down wearily where I was working. For what it's worth, she said, Zancy doesn't know what has thrown her parents into such a tizzy. She says it can't have been something Mr. Filmer said in the lounge before cocktails, because it sounded so silly. Did she tell you what he said? Nell nodded. Xanthi said Mr. Filmer asked her father if he would let him have voting right, and her father said he wouldn't part with the horse for anything, and they were both smiling, Xanthi said. Then Mr. Filmer, still smiling, said, We'll have to have a little talk about cats, and that was all. Mr. Filmer went into the dining car. Xanthi said she asked her father what Mr. Filmer meant, and he said, don't bother me, darling. Nell shook her head in puzzlement. So, anyway, Xanthi is now having a good time in the dome car lounge, and the rest of the family have gone off into their own car, and I'm deadly tired, if you want to know. Well, go to bed, then. The actors are all along in the lounge having their photos taken, she said, dismissing my suggestion as frivolous. They came up trumps tonight, didn't they? Brilliant, I said. Someone was asking Zack, who had tried to kidnap which horse at Toronto Station? What did he say? I asked, amused. It was the loosest of the loose ends. He said it had seemed a good idea at the time. She laughed. 
He said they'd had to change the script because the actor who was supposed to play the part of the kidnapper had broken his arm and couldn't appear. Everyone seemed to be satisfied. They're all very happy with the way it ended. People are kissing Donna and Mavis. Mavis is wearing the jewels. She yawned and reflected. Mr. Filmer didn't have any dinner, did he? Uh, perhaps I'd better go and see if he's all right. I dissuaded her. Antacids were taking care of it, I said. What one could give a man for a sick soul was another matter. From his point of view, he had made his move a fraction too early, I thought. If he hadn't already made the threat, the play wouldn't have had such a cataclysmic effect either on him or on Mercer. Mercer might have been warned as I'd intended, might have been made to think. But I couldn't have foreseen that it would happen the way it had, even though Filmer's smirk and Mercer's gloom had made me wonder. Just as well, perhaps, that I hadn't known about the cats when I invented the theft of the jewels. I might have been terribly tempted to hit even closer to home. Tortured horses, perhaps. What are you hatching now? Nell demanded. You've got that distant look. I, I haven't done a thing, I said. I'm not so sure. She stood up. She was wearing, in honour of the banquet, a boat-necked black blouse above the full black skirt, a pearl choker round her neck. Her fair hair was held back high in a comb, but not plaited, falling instead in informal curls. I thought with unnerving intensity that I didn't want to lose her, that for me it was no longer a game. I had known her for a week and a day. Reason said it wasn't long enough. Instinct said it was. Where are you staying in Vancouver? I asked. At the Four Seasons Hotel, with all the passengers. She gave me a small smile and went off towards the action. Oliver had finished clearing the cloths and was laying clean ones to leave the place looking tidy, he said. I left him to finish and made my way up the train to talk to George Burley, passing Filmer's closed door on the way. The sleeping car attendant was sitting in his roomette with the door open. I poked my head in and asked how the passenger was who'd asked for the antacid. He went up the train a while ago and came back. He didn't say anything, just walked past. Must be all right, I guess. I nodded and went on, and came to George sitting at his table with his endless forms. Come in, he invited, and I took my accustomed seat. I showed that photo, he said. Is that what you want to know about? Yes. He's definitely on the train. Name of Johnson, according to the passenger list. He has a roomette right forward, and he stays in it most of the time. He eats in the forward dome car dining room, but only dinner, eh? He was in there just now when I went up to the engine, but he'd gone when I came back. A fast eater, they say. Never goes for breakfast or lunch, never talks to anyone, eh? Hmm, I don't like it, I said. George chuckled. Ah, ho, ho, wait till you hear the worst. What's the worst? My assistant conductor, he's one of the sleeping car attendants up front. He says he's seen him before, eh? Seen him where? George watched me for effect. On the railways. On the... Do you mean he's a railwayman? Ah, he can't be sure. He says he looks like a baggage handler. He once worked with on the Toronto to Montreal sector a long time ago. Fifteen years ago. Twenty. Says if it's him, he had a chip on his shoulder all the time. No one liked him. He could be violent. You didn't cross him. Might not be him, though. He's older. And he doesn't remember the name Johnson, though I suppose it's forgettable. It's common enough. Would a baggage handler, I said slowly, know how to drain a fuel tank and uncouple the Lorimore's car? George's eyes gleamed with pleasure. The baggage handlers travel on the trains, eh? They're not fools. They take on small bits of freight at the stops and see the right stuff gets off. If you live around trains, you get to know how they work. Is there a baggage handler on this train? You bet your life. He's not always in the baggage car, not when we're going along. He eats, eh? He's always there in the stations, unlocking the doors. Uh, this one's not the best we've got, mind. A bit old, a bit fat. He chuckled. He said, 
He said he'd never seen this man, Johnson, but then he's always worked Vancouver to Banff, never Toronto to Montreal. Has the baggage handler or your assistant talked to Johnson? My assistant conductor says the only person Johnson talks to is one of the owners who raps on Johnson's door when he goes along to see his horse. He went up there this evening not long ago, and they had some sort of a, a row in the corridor outside my assistant's roomette. George, did your assistant hear what it was about? Important, is it? George said, beaming. Could be, very. Well, he didn't. He shook his head regretfully. He said he thought the owner told Johnson not to do something Johnson wanted to. They were shouting, he said, but uh, he didn't really listen, eh? He wasn't interested. Anyway, the owner came back down here, he said, and he heard Johnson say, I'll do what I friggin' like, very loudly. But he doesn't think the owner heard, as he'd gone by then. Yeah, that's not much help, I said. It's easier to start a train going downhill than to stop it, eh? Mm-hmm. Well, that's the best I can do for you. Well, I said... We do know he's on the train, and we know his name may or may not be Johnson, and we know he may or may not be a railway man, and I know for certain he has a violent personality. It sounds as if he's still planning something, and we don't know what. I suppose you are certain he can't get past the dragon lady. Nothing is certain. How about if you ask the baggage handler to sit in with her with the horses? He put his head on one side. Ha, uh, if you think she'd stand for it. Tell her it's to keep the horses safe, which it is. He chuckled. Ah, oh, don't see why not. He looked at his watch. Ah, uh, Sycamus is coming up. I'll go up there outside when we stop. Three or five minutes there, then it'll be time to put the clocks back an hour. Did your Miss Richmond remember to tell everyone? Yes, they're all on Pacific time already, I think getting on for midnight. We had stopped towards the end of dinner in a small place called Revelstoke for half an hour for all the cars to be refilled with water. At Kamloops, a far larger town, we would stop at two in the morning, very briefly. Then it was North Bend at 5.40, then the last stretch to Vancouver, arriving at five past ten on Sunday morning, a week from the day we set off. We slowed towards Sycamus while I was still with George. After here, though you won't see it, he said, we follow the shoreline of Shuswap Lake. The train goes slowly. It hasn't exactly been whizzing along through the Rockies. He nodded benignly. Oh, we, we go at thirty, thirty-five miles an hour fast enough, eh? Uphill, downhill, round hairpin bends. <laughs> there are more mountains ahead. He swung down onto the ground when the train stopped and crunched off forward to arrange things with the baggage handler. It was snowing outside, big dry flakes settling on others that had already fallen, harbingers of deep winter. The trains almost always went through, George had said. I thought I might as well see how the revelries were going, but it seemed that, unlike after the Winnipeg race, most people were feeling the long evening was dying. The lounge in the dome car was only half full. The observation deck was scarcely populated. The poker school in shirt sleeves were counting their money. The actors had vanished. Nell was walking towards me with Xanthi, whom she was seeing safely to bed in the upper bunk behind the felt curtains. Good night, Nell said softly. Sleep well, I replied. Good night, Xanthi said. I smiled. Good night. I watched them go along the corridor beside the bar. Nell turned round, hesitated, and waved. Xanthi turned also and waved. I waved back. Gentle was the word, I thought. Go gentle into this good night. No, no, it should be. Do not go gentle into that good night. Odd how poet's words stuck in one's head. Dylan Thomas, wasn't it? Do not go gentle into that good night, because that good night was death. The train was slowly going to sleep. There would be precious little peace, I thought, 
in the minds of the Lorimores, father, mother, and son. Little piece also in Filmer, who would know now from Johnson that the departure of Lenny Higgs had robbed him of the lever to be used against Daffodil, who could have doubts at the very least about Mercer's future reactions, who would know that Cumber Young would find out soon who had taken Ezra Gideon's horses, who would realise he was riding a flood tide of contempt. I wished him more than an upset stomach. I wished him remorse, which was the last thing he would feel. I wandered back through the train past George's office, which was empty, and stretched out in my own room on the bed, still dressed, with the door open and the light on, meaning just to rest but stay awake, and not surprisingly I went straight to sleep. I awoke to the sound of someone calling, George! George! Woke with a start and looked at my watch. I hadn't slept long, not more than ten minutes, but in that time the train had stopped. That message got me off the bed in a hurry. The train should have been moving. There was no stop scheduled for almost an hour. I went out into the passage and found an elderly man in a VIA grey suit like George's peering into the office. The elderly man looked at my uniform and said urgently, Where's George? I don't know, I said. What's the matter? We've got a hot box. He was deeply worried. George must radio to the dispatcher to stop the Canadian. Not again, I thought wildly. I went into George's office, following the VIA railman, who said he was the assistant conductor, George's deputy. Oh, can't you use the radio? I said. The conductor does it. The assistant conductor was foremost a sleeping car attendant, I supposed. I thought I might see if I could raise someone myself, as George would have already tuned in the frequency. But when I pressed the transmit switch, nothing happened at all, not even a click. And then I could see why it wouldn't work. The radio was soaking wet. There was an empty coffee cup beside it. With immense alarm, I said to George's assistant, What's a hot box? A hot axle, of course, he said. A journal box that holds the axle. It's under the horse car, and it's glowing dark red. We can't go on until it cools down and we put more oil in. How long does that take? Too long. They're putting snow on it. He began to understand about the radio. It's wet. It won't work, I said. Nor with the cellular telephone, not out in the mountains. How do we stop the Canadian? There must be ways from before radio. Mm, yes, but... He looked strained, the full enormity of the situation sinking in. You'll have to go back along the track and plant fusees. Fusees? Flares, of course. You're younger than me. You'll have to go. You'll be faster. He opened a cupboard in George's office and pulled out three objects, each about a foot in length, with a sharp metal spike at one end, the rest being tubular with granules on the tip. They looked like oversized matches, which was roughly what they were. You strike them on any rougher, hard surface, he said, like a rock or the rails. They burn bright red. They burn for twenty minutes. You stick the spike, throw it into the wooden ties in the middle of the track. The driver of the Canadian will stop at once when he sees it. His mind was going faster almost than his tongue. You'll have to go half a mile. It'll take the Canadian that much time to stop. Hurry now. Half a mile at least. And if the engineers are not in the cab... What do you mean? I asked aghast. If they're not in the cab? They aren't always there. One of them regularly flushes out the boiler, and the other one could be in the bathroom. If they aren't there, if they haven't seen the fusees and the train isn't stopping, you must light another flare and throw it through the window into the cab. Then when they come back, they'll stop. I stared at him. Well, that's impossible. They'll be there. They'll see the flares. Go now. Hurry. But that's what you do if you have to. Throw one through the window. He suddenly grabbed a fourth flare from the cupboard. You better take another one just in case. In case of what? What else could there be? In case of bears, he said. Chapter 18 With a feeling of complete unreality, I set off past the end of the train and along the single railway track in the direction of Toronto. With one arm I clasped the four flares to my chest. In the other hand I carried George's bright-beamed torch to show me the way. Half a mile? How long was half a mile? Hurry, George's assistant had said, of all unnecessary instructions. I half walked, half ran along the centre of the track, trying to step on the flat wood of the ties, the sleepers, 
because the stones in between were rough and speed-inhibiting. Bears? My God! It was cold. It had stopped snowing, but some snow was lying, not enough to give me problems. I hadn't thought to put on a coat. It didn't matter. Movement would keep me warm. Urgency and fierce anxiety would keep me warm. I began to feel it wasn't totally impossible. After all, it must have been done often in the old days. Standard procedure still, one might say. The flares had been there, ready. All the same, it was fairly eerie running through the night, with snow-dusted, rocky, tree-dotted hillsides climbing away on each side, and the two rails shining silver into the distance in front. I didn't see the danger in time, and it didn't growl. It wasn't a bear. It had two legs, and it was human. He must have been hiding behind rocks or trees in the shadow thrown by my torch. I saw his movement in the very edge of my peripheral vision after I'd passed him. I sensed an upswept arm, a weapon, a blow coming. There was barely a hundredth of a second for instinctive evasion. All I did as I ran was to lean forward a fraction so that the smash came across my shoulders, not on my head. It felt as if I'd cracked apart, but I hadn't. Feet, hands, muscles were all working. I staggered forward, dropped the flares and the torch, went down on one knee, knew another bang was travelling. Thought before action, I didn't have time. I turned towards him, not away, turned inside and under the swinging arm, rising, butting upwards of my head to find the aggressive chin, jerking my knee fiercely to contact between the braced legs, punching with clenched fist and the force of fury into the Adam's apple in his throat. One of the many useful things I'd learnt on my travels was how to fight dirty, and never had I needed the knowledge more. He grunted and wheezed with triple unexpected pain, and dropped to his knees on the ground and I wrenched the long piece of wood from his slackening hand and hit his own head with it, hoping I was doing it hard enough to knock him out, not hard enough to kill him. He fell quietly face down in the snow between the rails, and I rolled him over with my foot, and in the deflected beam of the torch, which lay unbroken a few paces away, saw the gaunt features of the man called Johnson. He had got, I reckoned, a lot more than he was used to, and I felt intense satisfaction, which was no doubt reprehensible, but couldn't be helped. I bent down, lifted one of his wrists, and hauled him unceremoniously over the rail and into the shadows away from the track. He was heavy. Also, the damage he'd done me when it came to lugging unconscious persons about was all too obvious. He might not have broken my back, which was what it had sounded like, but there were some badly squashed muscle fibres somewhere that weren't in first-class working order, and were sending stabbing messages of protest besides. I picked up the torch and looked for the flares, filled with an increased feeling of urgency, of time running out. I found three of the flares, couldn't see the fourth, decided not to waste time, thought the bears would have to lump it. Must be light-headed, I thought. Gotta get moving. I hadn't come anything like half a mile away from the train. I swung the beam back the way I'd come, but the train was out of sight round a corner that I hadn't noticed taking. But at a desperate moment I couldn't remember which direction I'd come from. Too utterly stupid if I ran the wrong way. Think, for God's sake. I swung the torch both ways along the track. Trees, rocks, silver parallel rails, all exactly similar. Which way? Think. I walked one way, and it felt wrong. I turned and went back. That was right. It felt right. It was the wind on my face, I thought. I'd been running before into the wind. The rails, the ties, seemed to stretch to infinity. I was going uphill also, I thought. Another bend to the right lay ahead. How long did half a mile take? I stole a glance at my watch, rolling my wrist round, which hurt somewhere high up, but with remote pain, not daunting. Couldn't believe the figures. Ten minutes only, or twelve, since I'd set off. A mile in ten minutes was ordinarily easy, but not a mile of sleepers and stones. Johnson had been waiting for me, I thought, not for me personally, but for whomever would come running from the train with the flares, which meant he knew the radio wouldn't work. I began actively to worry about George being missing. Perhaps Johnson had fixed the hot box to begin with. Johnson had meant the trains to crash with himself safely away to the rear. Johnson was darn well not going to succeed. With renewed purpose, with perhaps at last a feeling that all this was really happening and that I could indeed stop the Canadian, I pressed on along the track. George's voice floated into my head, telling me about the row between Johnson and Filmer. Filmer told Johnson not to do something, 
Johnson said, I'll do what I frigging like. Filmer could have told him not to try any more sabotage tricks on the train. Realising that trouble was anyway mounting up for him, trouble from which he might not be able to extricate himself if anything disastrous happened. Johnson, once started, couldn't be stopped. Easier to start a train running downhill than to stop it, eh? Johnson, with a chip on his shoulder from way back. The ex-railway man. The violent frightener. I had to have gone well over half a mile, I thought. Half a mile hadn't sounded far enough. The train itself was a quarter mile long. I stopped and looked at my watch. The Canadian would come in a very few minutes. There was another curve just ahead. I mustn't leave it too late. I ran faster, round the curve. There was another curve in a further hundred yards, but it would have to do. I put the torch down beside the track, rubbed the end of one of the flares sharply against one of the rails, and begged it, implored it to ignite. It lit with a huge red rush for which I was not prepared, nearly dropped it, rammed the spike into the wood of one of the ties. The flare burned in a brilliant fiery scarlet that would have been visible for a mile if only the track had been straight. I picked up the torch and ran on round the next bend, the red fire behind me washing all the snow with pink. Round that bend there was a much longer straight. I ran a good way, then stopped again and lit a second flare, jamming its point into the wood as before. The Canadian had to be almost there. I'd lost count of the time. The Canadian would come with its bright headlights and see the flare and stop with plenty of margin in hand. I saw pinpoint lights in the distance. I hadn't known we were anywhere near habitation. Then I realized the lights were moving, coming. The Canadian seemed to be advancing slowly at first, and then faster, and it wasn't stopping. There was no screech of brakes urgently applied. With a feeling of dreadful foreboding, I struck the third flare forcefully against the rail, almost broke it, felt it whoosh, stood waving it beside the track, beside the other flare stuck in the wood. The Canadian came straight on. I couldn't bear it, couldn't believe it. It was almost impossible to throw the flare through the window. The window was too small, too high up, and moving at thirty-five miles an hour. I felt puny on the ground beside the huge roaring advance of the yellow bulk of the inexorable engine with its blinding lights and absence of brain. It was there, then or never. There were no faces looking out from the cab. I yelled in a frenzy, STOP! And the sound blew away futilely on the bow wave of parting air. I threw the flare, threw it high, threw it too soon, missed the empty black window. The flare flew forward of it and hit the outside of the windscreen and fell onto the part of the engine sticking out in front. And then all sight of it was gone, the whole long, heavy silver train rolling past me at constant speed, making the ground tremble, extinguishing beneath it the second flare I'd planted in its path. It went on its mindless way, swept round the curve, and was gone. I felt disintegrated and sick, failure flooding back in the pain I'd disregarded. The trains would fold into each other, would concertina, would heap into killing chaos. In despair, I picked up the torch and began to jog the way the Canadian had gone. I would have to face what I hadn't been able to prevent, have to help even though I felt wretchedly guilty, couldn't bear the thought of the Canadian ploughing into the Lorimore's car. Someone would have warned the Lorimore's. Oh, God! God, someone must have warned the Lorimores. And everyone else. They would all be out of the train, away from the track. Nell, Zack, everybody. I ran round the curve. Ahead, lying beside the track, still burning, was the flare I'd thrown. Fallen off the engine. The first flare that I'd planted a hundred yards ahead before the next curve had vanished altogether, swept away by the Canadian. There was nothing. No noise, except the sighing wind. I wondered helplessly when I would hear the crash. I had no idea how far away the race train was, how far I'd run. Growing cold and with leaden feet, I plodded past the fallen flare and along and round the next bend, and round the long curve following. I hadn't heard the screech of metal tearing into metal, though it reverberated in my head. 
They must have warned the Lorimores. They must. I shivered among the freezing mountains from far more than frost. There were two red lights on the rails far ahead. Not bright and burning like the flares, but small and insignificant like reflectors. I wondered numbly what they were. And it wasn't until I'd gone about five more paces that I realised that they weren't reflectors. They were lights, stationary lights. And I began running faster again, hardly daring to hope. But then seeing that they were indeed the rear lights of a train. A train. It could be only one train. There had been no night-tearing crash. The Canadian had stopped. I felt swamped with relief. Near to tears, breathless. It had stopped. There was no collision. No tragedy. It had stopped. I ran towards the lights, seeing the bulk of the train now in the torch's beam, unreasonably afraid that the engineers would set off again and accelerate away. I ran until I was panting, until I could touch the train. I ran alongside it, sprinting now, urgent to tell them not to go on. There were several people on the ground up by the engine. They could see someone running towards them with a the torch, and when I was fairly near to them, one of them shouted out authoritatively, Get back on the train. There's no need for people to be out here. I slowed to a walk, very out of breath. I, uh, I called. I, I came from the train in front. I gestured along the rails ahead, which were vacant as far as one could see in the headlights of the Canadian. What train? one of them said as I finally reached them. The, the race train, I tried to breathe. Air came in gasps. Tra a transcontinental mystery race train. There was a silence. One of them said, It's supposed to be thirty-five minutes ahead of us. It had, I said, dragging in oxygen, a, a hot box. It meant a great deal to them. It explained everything. Oh! They took note of my uniform. It was you who lit the fusees? Yes. How far ahead is the other train? I, I don't know. I can't remember how far I ran. They consulted. One from his uniform was the conductor. Two, from their lack of it, were the engineers. There was another man there, perhaps the conductor's assistant. They decided, the conductor and the train driver himself decided to go forward slowly. They said I'd better come with them in the cab. Gratefully, lungs settling, I climbed up and stood watching as the engineer released the brakes, put on power, and set the train going at no more than walking pace, headlights bright on the empty track ahead. Did you throw one of the fusees? the engineer asked me. I didn't think you I didn't think you were going to stop. It sounded prosaic, unemotional. We weren't in the cab, he said. The one you threw hit the windscreen, and I could see the glare all the way down inside the engine where I was checking a valve. Just as well you threw it. I came racing up here just in time to see the one on the track before we ran over it. Bit of luck, you know. Yes. Bit of luck. Deliverance from a lifetime's regret. Why didn't the conductor radio? The conductor said crossly. Yeah, it's, it's out of order. He tut-tutted a bit. We rolled forward slowly. There was a bend ahead to the right. I, I think we're near now, I said. Not far. Right. The pace slowed further. The engineer inched carefully round the bend, and it was as well he did, because when he braked at that point to a halt, we finished with twenty yards between the front of the Canadian's yellow engine and the shining brass railing along the back platform of the Lorimore's car. Well, the engineer said phlegmatically, I wouldn't have wanted to come round the corner unawares to see that. It wasn't until then that I remembered that Johnson was somewhere out on the track. I certainly hadn't spotted him lying unconscious or dead on the ground on the return journey, and nor, obviously, had the Canadian's crew. I wondered briefly where he'd got to, but at that moment I didn't care. Everyone climbed down from the Canadian's cab, and the crew walked forward to join their opposite numbers ahead. I went with them. The two groups greeted each other without fuss. The race train lot seemed to take it for granted that the Canadian would stop in time. They didn't discuss flares, 
but hot boxes. The journal box, which held the near side end of the rearmost of the six axles of the horse car, had overheated, and it had overheated because, they surmised, the oil inside had somehow leaked away. That's what was usually wrong when this happened. They hadn't yet opened it. It no longer glowed red, but was too hot to touch. They were applying fresh snow all the time. Another ten minutes, perhaps. Where's George Burley? I asked. The race train baggage handler said no one could find him, but two sleeping car attendants were still searching for him. He told the others that it was a good thing he'd happened to be travelling in the horse car. He had smelled the hot axle, he said. He'd smelled that smell once before. Terrible smell, he said. He'd gone straight forward to tell the engineer to stop at once. Otherwise their axle would have broken and we could have had a derailment. The others nodded. They all knew. Did you warn any of the passengers? I asked. What? No, 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 no need to wake them up. But the Canadian might not have stopped. Of course it would. When it saw the fusees. Their faith amazed and frightened me. The conductor of the Canadian said that he would radio ahead to Kamloops, and both trains would stop there again, where there were multiple tracks, not just the one. Kamloops, he thought, would be getting worried soon that the race train hadn't arrived, and he went off to inform them. I walked back behind the horse car and boarded the race train, and almost immediately met George's assistant, who was walking forward. Where's George? I said urgently. He was worried. I, I can't find him. There's one place he might be, and please let him be there, I thought. Please don't let him be lying miles back in some dreadful condition beside the track. Where? he said. In one of the bedrooms. Look up the list. In Johnson's bedroom. Who? Johnson. Another sleeping car attendant happened to arrive at that point. I still can't find him, he said. Do you know where Johnson's room is? I asked anxiously. Yeah, nearer next to mine. Romette it is. Then let's look there. You can't go into a passenger's room in the middle of the night, he protested. If Johnson's there, we'll apologize. I can't think why you think George might be there, he grumbled, but he led the way back and pointed to a door. That's his. I opened it. George was lying on the bed, squirming in ropes, fighting against a gag, very much alive. Relieved beyond measure, I pulled off the gag, which was a wide band of adhesive plaster, firmly stuck on. Oh, damn it, that hurry, George said. What took you so long? George sat in his office, grimly drinking hot tea and refusing to lie down. He was concussed, one could see from his eyes but he would not admit that the blow to his head that had knocked him out had had any effect. As soon as he was free of the ropes and had begun to understand about the hot box, he had insisted that he and the conductor from the Canadian had a talk together in the forward dome car of the race train, a meeting attended by various other crew members and myself. The dispatcher in Kamloops, the Canadian's conductor reported, had said that as soon as the race train could set off again, it would proceed to Kamloops. The Canadian would follow ten minutes later. They would also alert a following freight train. The race train would remain at Kamloops for an hour. The Canadian would leave Kamloops first, so that it fell as little behind its timetable as possible. After all the journal boxes of the race train had been checked for heat, it would go on its way to Vancouver. There wouldn't be any inquiry at Kamloops, as it would be past three in the morning, Sunday morning, by then. The inquiry would take place at Vancouver. Everyone nodded. George looked white as if he wished he hadn't moved his head. The race train's engineer came to say that the box had been finally opened, it had been dry, and the oily waste had burned away, but all was now well. It was cool and filled again. It was not dripping out underneath, and the train could go on. They wasted no time. The Canadian's crew left, and the race train was soon on the move again as if nothing had happened. I went with George to his office, and then fetched him the tea and he groggily demanded I tell him from start to finish what was going on. N you tell me first how you came to be knocked out, I said. Um, I, I can't remember. Uh, I, was, I was walking up to see the engineers. He looked puzzled. First thing I knew, I, I was lying there, trussed up. I, I was there for ages. Couldn't understand it. He hadn't a chuckle left in him. I was in Johnson's roomette, they said. Well, Johnson did it, I suppose. Jumped me. Yes. Where is he now? Heaven knows. 
I told George about Johnson's attacking me, and how I'd left him, and how I hadn't seen him anywhere on the way back. Mm. Two possibilities, George said. Three, I suppose. Either he buggered off somewhere, or he's getting a ride on the Canadian right now. I stared. Hadn't thought of that. And what's the third? I asked. A tired gleam crept into George's disorientated eyes. The mountain where we stopped, he said. That was Squillax Mountain. Squillax is the Indian word for black bear. I swallowed. I, I didn't see any bears. Ah, oh, just as well. I didn't somehow think Johnson had been eaten by a bear. I couldn't believe in it. I thought I must have been crazy, but I hadn't believed in bears all the time I'd been out there on Black Bear Mountain. Eh, know something, George said. The new rolling stock can't easily get hot boxes. The axles run on ball bearings, eh? Not oily waste. Only old cars, like the horse car, will always be vulnerable. Know what? You bet your life Johnson took most of the waste out of that box when we stopped in Brevelstoke. Why do you say oily waste? I asked. Rags, rags in the oil. Makes a better cushion for the axle than plain oil. I've known one sabotage before, mind. Only that time they... They didn't just take the rags out, they put iron filings in, eh? Derailed the train. Another railway man with the grudge, that was. But hot boxes do happen by accident. They've got heat sensors with alarm systems beside the track in some places because of that. How did that Johnson ever think he'd get away with it? He doesn't know we have a photo of him. George began to laugh and thought better of it. Oh, oh. You kill me, Tommy. Ugh. But what was my assistant thinking of? Sending you off with the fusees. It was his job, eh? He should have gone. Well, he said I'd go faster. Well, yes, I suppose he was right. But you weren't really cruel. He'd forgotten, I said. But I thought he might have warned the Lorimores and everyone else to get them out of danger. George considered it. I'm not going to say he should. I'm not going to say he shouldn't. Railway men sticking together? Ah, he's coming up to his pension. And no one was as much as jolted off their beds, eh? Lucky. Trains always stop for flares, he said comfortably. I left it. I suppose one couldn't lose a man his pension for not doing something that had proved unnecessary. We ran presently into Kamloops, where the axles were all checked, the radio was replaced, and everything else went according to plan. Once we were moving again, George finally agreed to lie down in his clothes and try to sleep, and two doors along from him I tried the same. Things always start hurting when one has time to think about them. The dull ache where Johnson's piece of wood had landed on the back of my left shoulder was intermittently sharply sore. All right when I was standing up, not so good lying down. A bore. It'd be stiffer still, I thought, in the morning. A pest for serving breakfast. I smiled to myself, finally. In spite of Johnson's and Filmer's best efforts, the great transcontinental mystery race train might yet limp without disaster to Vancouver. Complacency, I should have remembered, was never a good idea. Chapter 19 It was discomfort, as much as anything, which had me on my feet again soon after six. Emile wouldn't have minded if I'd been late, as few of the passengers were early breakfasters, but I thought I'd do better in the dining car. I stripped off the waistcoat and shirt for a wash and a shave, and inspected in the mirror as best I could the fairly horrifying bruise already colouring a fair-sized area across my back. Better than on my head, I thought resignedly. Look on the bright side. I put on a clean shirt and the spare clean waistcoat, and decided that this was one VIA rail operative who was not going to polish his shoes that morning, despite the wear and tear on them from the night's excursions. I brushed my hair instead. Tommy looked tidy enough, I thought, for his last appearance. It wasn't yet light. 
I went forward through the sleeping train to the kitchen, where Angus was not only awake, but singing Scottish ballads at the top of his voice, while filling the air with the fragrant, yeasty smell of his baking. The dough, it seemed, had risen satisfactorily during the night. Emile, Oliver, Cathy, and I laid the tables and set out fresh flowers in the bud vases, and in time, with blue skies appearing outside, poured coffee and ferried sausages and bacon. The train stopped for a quarter of an hour in a place called North Bend, our last stop before Vancouver, and ran on down what the passengers were knowledgeably calling Fraser Canyon. Hell's Gate, they said with relish, lay ahead. The track seemed to me to be clinging to the side of a cliff. Looking out of the window by the kitchen door, one could see right down to a torrent rushing between rocky walls, brownish tumbling water with foam-edged waves. The train, I was pleased to note, was negotiating this extraordinary feat of engineering at a suitably circumspect crawl. If it went too fast round these bends, it would fly off into space. I took a basket of bread down to the far end, just as Mercer Lorimore came through from the dome car. Although Cathy was down there also, he turned from her to me and asked if I could possibly bring hot tea through to his own car. Certainly, sir. Any breads? He looked vaguely at the basket. Um, no, no, just, just tea for three of us. He nodded, turned, and went away. Cathy raised her eyebrows and said with tolerance, Chauvinist pig! Emile shook his head a bit over the private order, but made sure the tray I took looked right from his point of view, and I swayed through on the mission. The lockable door in the Lorimore's car was open. I knocked on it, however, and Mercer appeared in the far doorway to the saloon at the rear. Along here, please. I went along there. Mercer, dressed in a suit and tie, gestured to me to put the tray on the coffee table. Bambi wasn't there. Sheridan sprawled in an armchair in jeans, trainers, and a big white sweatshirt with the words, Make Waves, on the front. I found it difficult to look at Sheridan pleasantly. I could think of nothing but cats. He himself still wore the blank look of the evening before, as if he had opted out of thinking. We'll pour, Mercer said. Come back in half an hour for the tray. Yes, sir. I left them and returned to the dining car. The chill within Bambi, I thought, was because of the cats. Nell and Xanthi had arrived during my absence. My goodness, you look grim, Nell exclaimed, then remembering, said more formally, Uh, what's for breakfast? I got rid of the grimness and handed her the printed menu. Xanthi said she would have everything that was going. Has George told you that we're running late? I asked Nell. No. His door was shut. Are we? How much? About an hour and a half. I forestalled her question. We had to stop in the night at Kamloops to get George's radio fixed, and then we had to wait there for the Canadian to go ahead of us. I'd better tell everyone, then. What time do we get to Vancouver? About 11.30, I think. Right, thanks. I almost said, be my guest, but not quite. Tommy wouldn't. Nell's eyes were smiling all the same. Cathy chose that exact moment to go past me with a tray of breakfast, or not exactly past, but rather against me, where it seemed to hurt most. Sorry, she said contritely, going on her way. That's okay. It was difficult always to pass in the swaying aisle without touching. Couldn't be helped. Filmer came into the dining room and sat at the table nearest to the kitchen, normally the least favourite with the passengers. He looked as if he'd spent a bad night. Here you, he said abruptly at my approach, having apparently abandoned the Mr. Nice Guy image. Yes, sir, I said. Coffee, he said. Yes, sir. Now. Yes, sir. I gave Xanthi's order to Simon, who was stiffly laying a baking sheet of sausages in the oven in silent protest at life in general, and I took the coffee pot on a tray to film her. Why do we stop in the night? he demanded. Uh, I, I believe it was to fix the radio, sir. We stopped twice, he said accusingly. Why? I don't know, sir. I expect the conductor could tell you. I wondered what he'd do if I said, Your man Johnson nearly succeeded in wrecking the train with you in it. It struck me then that perhaps his inquiry was actually anxiety, 
that he wanted to be told that nothing dangerous had happened. He did seem marginally relieved by my answer, and I resisted the temptation of wiping out all that relief by telling him that the radio had been sabotaged, because the people at the next table were listening also. Spreading general gloom and fright was not in my brief. Selective gloom, selective fright, sure. Others, it seemed, had noticed the long stops in the night, but no one seriously complained. No one minded letting the Canadian go on in front. The general good humour and the party atmosphere prevailed and excused everything. The train ride might be coming to an end, but meanwhile there was the spectacular gorge outside to be exclaimed over, the city of Vancouver to be looked forward to, the final race to promise a sunburst of a conclusion. The great transcontinental race train, they were saying, had been just that. Great. After half an hour or so, I went back to the Lorimore's car to fetch the tray of teacups. I knocked on the door, but as there was no answer, I went anyway along to the saloon. Mercer was standing there, looking bewildered, looking haggard, stricken with shock. Sir? I said. His eyes focused on me vaguely. My son, he said. Sir? Sheridan wasn't in the saloon. Mercer was alone. Stop the train, he said. We must go back. Oh, God, I thought. He, he, he went out onto the platform to look at the river. Mercer could hardly speak. When, when I looked up, he, he wasn't there. The door to the platform was closed. I went past Mercer, opened the door and went out. There was no one on the platform, as he'd said. There was wind in plenty. The polished brass top of the railings ran round at waist height, with both of the exit gates still firmly bolted. Over the right-hand side, from time to time, there were places which offered a straight, unimpeded, hundred-foot drop to the fearsome, frothing, rocky river below. Death beckoned there. A quick death. I went into the saloon and closed the door. Mercer was swaying with more than the movement of the train. Sit down, sir, I said, taking his arm. I'll tell the conductor he'll know what to do. We, we must go back. He sat down with buckling legs. He, he went out, and, and when I looked... Will you be all right while I go to the conductor? He nodded dully. Yeah. Yes, hurry. I hurried, myself feeling much of Mercer's bewildered shock, if not his complicated grief. Half an hour earlier, Sheridan hadn't looked like someone about to jump off a cliff. But then I supposed that I'd never seen anyone else at that point, so how would I know? Perhaps the blank look, I thought, had been a sign, if anyone could have read it. I hurried everywhere except through the dining car, so as not to be alarming. And when I reached George's room, I found the door still shut. I knocked. No reply. I knocked again harder and called his name with urgency. George! There was a grunt from inside. I opened the door without more ado and found him still lying on the bed in his clothes, waking from a deep sleep. I closed his door behind me and sat on the edge of his bed and told him we'd lost a passenger. In, in the Fraser Canyon? he repeated. He shunted himself up into a sitting position, and put both hands to his head, wincing. W when About ten minutes ago, I should think. He stretched out a hand to the radio, looking out of the window to get his bearings. Ah, oh, it's no use going back, you know. Not if you went into the water from this height. And the river's bitter cold, and you can see how fast it is. And there's a whirlpool. His father will go, though. Ah, uh, of course. The dispatcher he got through to this time was in Vancouver. He explained that Mercer Lorimore's son, that was right, the Mercer Lorimore, his twenty-year-old son had fallen from the rear of the race train into Fraser Canyon, somewhere between Hell's Gate and a mile or two south of Yale. Mercer Lorimore wanted the train stopped so that he could go back to find his son. He, George Burley, wanted instructions from Montreal. The dispatcher, sounding glazed, told him to hang on. 
There was no chance now, I thought, of reaching Vancouver without a disaster. Sheridan was a disaster of major proportions, and the press would be at Vancouver Station for all the wrong reasons. I think I'd better go back to Mercer, I said. George nodded gingerly. Tell him I'll, I'll come to talk to him when I get instructions from Montreal, eh? He rubbed a hand over his chin. He'll have to put up with stubble. I returned to the dining car and found Nell still sitting beside Xanthi. I said into Nell's ear, Bring Xanthi into the private car. She looked inquiringly into my face and saw nothing comforting. But she got Xanthi to move without alarming her. I led the way through the dome car and through the join into the rear car, knocking again on the unlocked door. Mercer came out of his and Bambi's bedroom further up the corridor, looking grey and hollow-eyed, a face of unmistakable calamity. Daddy, Xanthi said, pushing past me. What's the matter? He folded his arms round her and hugged her, and took her with him towards the saloon. Neither Nell nor I heard the words he murmured to her, but we both heard her say sharply, No, he couldn't. Couldn't what? Nell said to me quietly. Sheridan went off the back platform into the canyon. Do you mean, she was horrified, that he's dead? I would think so. Oh, shit, Nell said. My feelings exactly, I thought. We went on into the saloon. Mercer said almost mechanically, Why don't we stop? We have to go back. He no longer sounded, I thought, as if he expected or even hoped to find Sheridan alive. Sir, the conductor is radioing for instructions, I said. He nodded. He was a reasonable man in most circumstances. He had only to look out of the window to know that going back wouldn't help. He knew that it was practically impossible for anyone to fall off the platform by accident. He certainly believed, from his demeanour, that Sheridan had jumped. Mercer sat on the sofa his arm around Xanthi beside him, her head on his shoulder. Xanthi wasn't crying. She looked serious, but calm. The tragedy for Xanthi hadn't happened within that half hour. It had been happening all her life. Her brother had been lost to her, even when alive. Nell said, Shall we go, Mr. Larimore? Meaning herself and me. Can I do anything for Mrs. Larimore? N no, no, he said. Stay. He swallowed. You'll have to know what's decided. What to tell everyone. He shook his head helplessly. W we must make some decisions. George arrived at that point and sat down in an armchair near Mercer, leaning forward with his forearms on his knees and saying how sorry he was, how very sorry. We have to go back, Mercer said. Oh, yes, sir, but... Not the whole train, sir. Montreal says the train must go on to Vancouver as scheduled. Mercer began to protest. George interrupted him. Sir, Montreal say that they are already alerting all the authorities along the canyon to look out for your son. They say they will arrange transport for you to return, you and your family, as soon as we reach Vancouver. Uh, you can see, he glanced out of the window, that the area is unpopulated, eh? but there are often people working by the river. There is a, a road running along quite near the canyon, as well as another railway line on the other side. There's a small town over there called, um... He coughed. Uh, Hope. It's at the south end of the canyon, eh? Where the river broadens out and runs more slowly. We're almost at that point now, as you'll see. If you go to Hope, Montreal says... You'll be in the area if there is any news. How do I get there? Mercer said. Is there a train back? George said, There is, yes, but only one a day. It's the Supercontinental. It leaves Vancouver at four in the afternoon, passes through Hope at seven. Well, that's useless, Mercer said. How far is it by road? About a hundred and fifty kilometers. He reflected. I'll get a helicopter, he said. There was absolutely no point in being rich, I thought, 
if one didn't know how to use it. The logistics of the return were making Mercer feel better, one could see. George told him that the train we were on would speed up considerably once we were clear of the canyon, and that we'd be in Vancouver in two hours and a half. They discussed how to engage a helicopter. Mercer already had a car meeting him at the station. Nell said Mary and Co. would arrange everything as they had indeed already arranged the car. No problem if she could reach her office by telephone. George shook his head. He would relay the message by radio through Montreal. He brought out a notepad to write down Mary and Co.'s number and the instruction, Arrange helicopter, Nell will phone from Vancouver. I'll phone from the train, she said. George stood up. I'll get moving then, Mr. Larmore. We'll do everything possible. He looked big, awkward, and unshaven, but Mercer had taken strength from him and was grateful. My sympathy, George said, to Mrs. Larimore. The tray of empty teacups still lay where I'd left it on the coffee table. I picked it up and asked if there was anything I could bring them, but Mercer shook his head. I'll come and find you, Xanthi said, if they need anything. She sounded competent and grown up, years older than at breakfast. Nell gave her a swift, sweet glance of appreciation. And she, George, and I made our way back into the dome car, George hurrying off to his radio, and Nell sighing heavily over what to say to the other passengers. It'll spoil the end of their trip, she said. Try them. You're cynical. Hmm, pretty often. She shook her head as if I were a lost cause and went into the dining room with the bad news, which was predictably greeted with shock but no grief. Poor Xanthi, Rose Young exclaimed, and Mrs. Unwin said, Poor Bambi! The sympathy stage lasted ten seconds. The deliciously round-eyed, Isn't it dreadful? stage went on all morning. Julius Apollo Filmer was no longer in the dining room, and I wished he had been as I would like to have seen his reactions. Chance would seem to have robbed him of his lever against Mercer. Or would he reckon that Mercer would still sacrifice one horse to preserve the reputation of the dead? Filmer could read it wrong, I thought. There was a cocktail party scheduled for that evening in the Four Seasons Hotel for Vancouver's racing bigwigs to meet the owners. Would it still be held? several anxiously asked. Certainly, Nell answered robustly. The party and the race will go on. No one, not even I, was cynical enough to say... Sheridan would have wished it. I helped clear away the breakfast and wash the dishes and pack everything into boxes for sending back to the caterers in Toronto. And when we'd finished, I found that Nell had collected gratuities from the passengers to give to the waiters, and Emile, Cathy, and Oliver had split it four ways. Emile put a bundle of notes into my hand, and he and the others were smiling. I can't take it, I said. Emile said, we know you aren't a waiter, and we know you aren't an actor, but you have worked for it. It's yours. And we know you've worked all morning, although it's obvious you've hurt your arm, Kathy said. I made it worse. I'm really sorry. And it would all have been very much harder work without you, Oliver said. So we thought we'd like to give you a present. And that's it, Kathy added, pointing to the notes. They waited expectantly, wanting my thanks. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I kissed Cathy suddenly, hugged her. All right. I'll buy something to remember us by, to remember the journey. Thank you all very much. They laughed, pleased. It's been fun, Cathy said. And Emile added ironically, But not every week. I shook Emile's hand and Oliver's, kissed Cathy again, shook hands with Angus, was offered Simon's cheek for a peck. I looked round at their faces, wanting to hold on to the memory. See you again, I said, and they said, yes, and we all knew it was doubtful. I went away along the swaying corridor, taking Tommy to extinction, and, as often in the past, not looking back. Too many regrets in looking back. In the sleeping cars, everyone was packing and holding impromptu parties in each other's rooms, walking in and out of the open doors. Filmer's door was shut. 
Nell was in her roomette, with the door open, packing. "'What's wrong with your arm?' she said, folding one of the straight skirts. "'Is it so obvious?' "'Most obvious when Kathy bumped into you with her tray. The shock went right through you. Yes, well, it's not serious. I'll get you a doctor. Oh, don't be silly.' "'I suppose,' she said, "'Mercer won't run his horse now on Tuesday. "'Such a shame. "'That damned Sheridan!' "'The biblical description, I thought, was accurate. "'Zancy,' Nell said, putting the skirt in her suitcase, "'says you were kind to her at Lake Louise. "'Did you really say something about the corruption of self-importance? "'She said she learned a lot. "'She grew up this morning,' I said. "'Yes, didn't she?' If we go to Hawaii, I said, you can wear a sarong and a hibiscus behind your ear. She paused in the packing. They wouldn't really go, she said judiciously, with a clipboard. George came out of his office and told her the cellular telephone was now working if she wanted to make her calls. And I went into my roomette and changed out of uniform into Tommy's outdoor clothes and packed everything away. The train journey might be finished, I was thinking, but my real job wasn't. There was much to be done. Filmer might be sick, but it was sick sharks that attacked swimmers, and there could still be a dorsal fin unseen below the surface. Nell came out of George's office and along to my door. No helicopter needed, she said. They found Sheridan already. Oh, that was quick. Apparently he fell onto a fish ladder. You're kidding me. No, actually. She stifled a laugh, as improper to the occasion. George says the ladders are a sort of staircase hundreds of meters long that are built in the river because the salmon can't swim upstream to spawn against the strength of the water, because the water flows much faster than it used to, because a huge rockfall constricted it. I'll believe it, I said. Some men were working on the lower ladder, she said, and Sheridan was swept down in the water. Dead? I asked. Very. You better tell Mercer. She made a reluctant face. You do it. Oh, I can't. George could. George agreed to go with the good bad news, and hurried off so as to be back at his post when we reached the station. Did you know, I said to Nell, that Emile, Cathy, and Oliver wanted to share their tips with me? Yes. They asked me if I thought it would be all right. I do hope, she said with sudden anxiety, that you accepted... They said you'd been great. They wanted to thank you. They were so pleased with themselves. Yes, I said, relieved to be able to. I accepted. I told them I'd buy something to remind me of them and the trip. And I will. She relaxed. I should have warned you, but then, I guess, no need. She smiled. What are you, really? Happy, I said. Yuck! I try hard, but it keeps breaking out. My boss threatens to fire me for it. Who is your boss? Brigadier Valentine Cato. She blinked. I never know when you're telling the truth. Cato, I thought. Cats. Sobering. I have just, I said slowly, been struck by a blinding idea. Yes, you rather look like it. Time, I thought, not enough of it. Come back, Nell said. I've lost you. You don't happen to have a world air timetable with you, do you? There are several in the office. What do you want? A flight from London to Vancouver tomorrow. She raised her eyebrows, went into George's office, consulted on the telephone, and came out again. Air Canada leaves Heathrow 3 p.m., arrives Vancouver 4.25. Consider yourself kissed. Are you still a waiter, then, in the eyes of the passengers? There were passengers all the time in the corridor. Hmm, I said thoughtfully. I think so. For another two days, to the end. All right. George returned and reported that all three of the Lorimores had received the news of Sheridan calmly and would go to the hotel as planned and make arrangements from there. Poor people, Nell said. What a mess! I asked George what he would be doing. Going back to Toronto, of course, possibly by train, as soon as the various VIA inquiries were completed, which would be tomorrow. Couldn't he stay for the race, I asked, and go back on the Tuesday evening? 
he wasn't sure. I took him into his office and convinced him, and he was chuckling again as the train slowed to a crawl and inched into the terminus at Vancouver. The wheels stopped. Seven days almost to the hour since they'd set off. The passengers climbed down from the travelling hotel and stood in little groups outside, still smiling and still talking. Zack and the other actors moved among them, shaking farewell hands. The actors had commitments back in Toronto and weren't staying for the race. Zack saw me through the window and bounced up again into the sleeping car to say goodbye. Don't lose touch now, he said. Any time you want a job writing mysteries, let me know. Okay. Bye, guy he said. Bye. He jumped off the train again and trailed away beneath his mop of curls towards the station buildings, with Donna, Pierre, Raoul, Mavis, Walter and Giles, following like meteorites after a comet. I waited for Filmer to pass. He walked on his own, looking heavy and intent. He was wearing an overcoat and carrying the briefcase, and not bothering to be charming. There was a firmness of purpose in his step that I didn't much like, and when Nell took a pace forward to ask him something, he answered her with a brief turn of his head, but no break in his stride. When he'd gone, I jumped down beside Nell, who was carefully checking other passengers off against a list on the clipboard as they passed. It was a list, I discovered by looking over her shoulder, of the people catching the special bus to check into the Four Seasons Hotel. Against Filmer's name, as against all the others, I was relieved to see a tick. Ah, oh, that's everyone, Nell said finally. She looked towards the rear of the train. Except the Lorimores, of course. I'd better go and help them. I stepped back on board to collect my gear, and through the window watched the little solemn party pass by outside. Mercer, head up, looking sad, Bambi expressionless, Xanthi caring, Nell concerned. Some way after them I walked forward through the train. It was quiet and empty, the racegoers having flooded away, the surly cook gone from the centre diner, the day-nighter no longer alive with singing, the doors of the empty bedroom standing open, the Chinese cook vanished with his grin. I climbed down again and went on forward, past the baggage car where I collected my suitcase from the handler, and past the horse car where Leslie Brown was leaning out of the window, still a dragon. Bye. I said. She looked at me as if puzzled for a second, and then recognized me. Calgary and Lenny Higgs were three days back. Oh, yes. Goodbye. The train was due to shunt out backwards, to take the horses and the grooms to a siding, from where they would go by road to Exhibition Park. Miss Brown was going with them, it seemed. Good luck at the races, I said. I never bet. Well... Have a good time. She looked as if that were an unthinkable suggestion. I waved to her, the stalwart custodian, and went on past the engine where the engineer was a shadowy figure high up behind his impossibly small window, went on into the station. The Lorimores had been interrupted by people with notebooks, cameras and deadlines. Mercer was being civil. Nell extricated the family and ushered them to their car, and herself climbed into the long bus with the owners. I hung back until they'd all gone, then travelled in a taxi, booked in at the Hyatt, and telephoned England. The brigadier wasn't at home in Newmarket. I could try his club in London, a voice said, giving me the familiar number, and I got connected to the bar of the Hob Sandwich, where the brigadier, I was relieved to hear, was at that moment receiving his first of the evening well-watered scotch. Tall, he said. Where are you? Vancouver. I could hear the clink of the glasses and the murmurings in the background. I pictured the dark oak walls with the gentlemen in the pictures with side whiskers, big pads, and little caps, and it all seemed far back in time, not just in distance. Um, I said, can I phone you again when you're alone? This is going to take some time. I mean, soon, really. Urgent? Fairly. Hold on. I'll go upstairs to my bedroom and get them to transfer the call. Don't go away. I waited through a few clicks until his voice came quietly on the line again without sound effects. Right. What's happened? I talked for what seemed a very long time. 
He punctuated my pauses with grunts to let me know he was still listening. And at the end he said, You don't ask much, do you? Just for miracles. There's an Air Canada flight from Heathrow at three tomorrow afternoon, I said. And they'll have all day and all Tuesday to find the information, because when it's only eleven in the morning in Vancouver on Tuesday, it'll be seven in the evening in England, and they could send it by fax. Always supposing, he said dryly, that there's a fax machine in the Jockey Club in Exhibition Park. I'll check, I said. If there isn't, I'll get one. What does Bill Baudelaire think of all this? he asked. I haven't talked to him yet. I had to get your reaction first. What's your phone number? he asked. I'll think it over and ring you back in ten minutes. Thought before action? You can't fault it if there's time. He thought for twice ten minutes until I was itchy. When the bell rang, I took a deep breath and answered. We'll attempt it, he said. As long as Bill Baudelaire agrees, of course. If we can't find the information in the time available, we may have to abort. All right. Apart from that, he said. Well done. Good staff work, I said. He laughed. Flattery will get you no promotion. Chapter 20 I was looking forward to talking to Mrs. Baudelaire. I dialed her number and Bill himself answered. Hello, I said, surprised. It's Tor Kelsey. How's your mother? There was a long, awful pause. She's, she's ill, I said with anxiety. She, oh, she, she, she died early this morning. Oh, no. She couldn't have, I thought. It couldn't be true. I talked to her yesterday. I said. We knew, she knew, it, it would only be weeks. But yesterday evening there was a crisis. I was silent. I felt her loss as if she'd been Aunt Viv restored to me and snatched away. I'd wanted so very much to meet her. Tor, Bill's voice said. I swallowed. Your mother was great. He would hear the smothered tears in my voice, I thought. He would think me crazy. If it's of any use to you, he said. She felt like that about you, too. You made her last week a good one. She wanted to live to find out what happened. One of the last things she said was, I don't want to go before the end of the story. I want to see that invisible young man. She was slipping away all the time. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Tor, Bill said. I'm so very sorry, I said with more control. So sorry. Thank you. I don't suppose, I said and paused, feeling helpless. You suppose wrong he replied instantly. I've been waiting here for you to phone. We would both fail her if we didn't go straight on. I've had hours to think this out. The last thing she would want would be for us to give up. So I'll start things off by telling you we've had a telex from Filmer, announcing that he is the sole owner of Laurentide Ice. But we are going to inform him that the Ontario Racing Commission are rescinding his license to own horses. We're also telling him he won't be admitted to the President's lunch at Exhibition Park. I'd, um, I'd like to do it differently, I said. How do you mean? I sighed deeply and talked to him also for a long time. He listened as the brigadier had, with intermittent throat noises. And at the end he said simply, I do wish she'd been alive to hear all this. Yes, so do I. Well, he paused. I'll go along with it. The real problem is time. Mm-hmm. You'd better talk to Mercer Lorimer yourself. But no buts. You're there. I can't get there until tomorrow late afternoon. Not with all you want me to do here. Talk to Mercer without delay. You don't want him coming back to Toronto. I said with reluctance, well, all right, but I had known that I would have to. 
Good. Use all the authority you need. Val and I will back you. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow, he said. I put the receiver down slowly. Death could be colossally unfair, one knew that, but rage, rage. I felt anger for her as much as grief. Do not go gentle into that good night. I thought it probable, if I remembered right, that the last word she'd said to me was, Good night. Good night, dear, dear Mrs. Baudelaire. Go gentle, go sweetly into that good night. I sat for a while without energy, feeling the lack of sleep, feeling the nagging pain, feeling the despondency her death had opened the door to, feeling unequal to the next two days, even though I'd set them up myself. With an effort, after an age, I got through to the Four Seasons Hotel and asked for Mercer, but found myself talking to Nell. All the calls are being rerouted to me, she said. Bambi's lying down. Mercer and Santhi are on their way to Hope in the helicopter, which was reordered for him so that he can identify Sheridan's body, which is being taken there by road. It all sounds so clinical. The authorities want to make sure it's Sheridan before they make any arrangements. When will Mercer and Xanthi be back, do you know? About six, they expected. Um, the jockey club asked me to fix up a brief meeting. Do you think Mercer would agree to that? He's being terrifically helpful to everyone, almost too calm. I thought things over. Can you get hold of him in hope? She hesitated. Yes, I suppose so. I have the address and the phone number of where he's going, but I think it's a police station or a mortuary. Could you, could you tell him that on their return to the hotel a car will be waiting to take him straight on to a brief meeting with the jockey club? Tell him the jockey club send their sincere condolences and ask for just a little of his time. Well, I guess I could, she said doubtfully. What about Santhi? Mercer alone, I said positively. Is it important? she asked, and I could imagine her frowning. I think it's important for Mercer. All right, she made up her mind. Xanthi can take the phone calls for her mother, then, because I have to go to this cocktail party. A thought struck her. Aren't some of the jockey club coming to the party? Mercer won't want to go. They want a quiet talk with him alone. Okay, then, I'll try to arrange it. Very many thanks, I said fervently. I'll call back to check. I called back at five o'clock. The helicopter was in the air on its way back, Nell said and Mercer had agreed to being picked up at the hotel. You're brilliant. Tell the jockey club not to keep him long. He'll be tired. And he's identified Sheridan. I could kiss you, I said. The way to a man's heart is through his travel agent. She laughed. Always supposing that's where one wants to go. She put her receiver down with a delicate click. I did not want to lose her, I thought. The car I sent for Mercer picked him up successfully and brought him to the Hyatt, the chauffeur telling him, as requested, the room to go straight up to. He rang the doorbell of the suite I'd engaged, more or less in his honour, and I opened the door to let him in. He came in about two paces, and then stopped and peered with displeasure at my face. "'What is this?' he demanded with growing anger, preparing to depart. I closed the door behind him. "'I work for the jockey club.' I said. The British Jockey Club. I am seconded here with the Canadian Jockey Club for the duration of the race train celebration of Canadian racing. But, but you're, uh, you're... My name is Tor Kelsey, I said. It was judged better that I didn't go openly on the train as a sort of security agent for the Jockey Club, so I went as a waiter. He looked me over, looked at the rich young owner's good suit that I'd put on for the occasion, looked at the expensive room. My God, he said weakly. He took a few paces forward. Why am I here? I work for Brigadier Valentine Cato in England, I said, and Bill Baudelaire over here. They are the heads of the Jockey Club Security Services. He nodded. He knew them. As they cannot be here, they have both given me their authority to speak to you on their behalf. Yes, but what about? Would you sit down? 
Would you like a, a drink? He looked at me with a certain dry humour. Do you have any identification? Yes. I fetched my passport. He opened it, looked at my name, at my likeness, and at my occupation. Investigator. He handed it back. Yes, I'll, I'll have a drink, he said, as you're so good at serving them. Cognac, if possible. I opened the cupboard that the hotel had supplied at my request with wine, vodka, scotch, and brandy, and poured the amount I knew he'd like, even adding the heretical ice. He took the glass with a twist of a smile and sat in one of the armchairs. No one guessed about you, he said. No one came anywhere near it. He took a sip reflectively. Why were you on the train? I was sent because of one of the passengers. Because of Julius Filmer. The ease that had been growing in him fled abruptly. He put the glass down on the table beside him and stared at me. Mr. Lorimore, I said, sitting down opposite him. I'm sorry about your son. Truly sorry. All of the jockey club send their sympathy. I think, though, that I should tell you straight away that Brigadier Cato, Bill Baudelaire, and myself all know about the, uh, incident of the cats. He looked deeply shocked. You can't know. I imagine that Julius Filmer knows also. He made a hopeless gesture with one hand. However did he find out? The brigadier is working on that in England. And how did you find out? Not from anyone you swore to silence. Not from the college? No. He covered his face briefly with one hand. Julius Filmer may still suggest you give him voting right in exchange for his keeping quiet, I said. He lowered the hand to his throat and closed his eyes. I've thought of that, he said. He opened his eyes again. Did you see the last scene of the mystery? Yes, I said. I haven't known what to do since then. It's you who has to decide, I said. But can I tell you a few things? He gave a vague gesture of assent, and I talked to him also for quite a long time. He listened with total concentration, mostly watching my face. People who were repudiating in their minds every word one said didn't look at one's face but at the floor or at a table, at anything else. I knew by the end that he would do what I was asking, and I was grateful because it wouldn't be easy for him. When I'd finished, he said thoughtfully, That mystery was no coincidence, was it? The father blackmailed because of his child's crime? The groom murdered because he knew too much? The man who would kill himself if he couldn't keep his racehorses? Did you write it yourself? All that part, yes, not from the beginning. He smiled faintly. You showed me what I was doing, was prepared to do. But beyond that, you showed Sheridan. I wondered, I said. Did you? Why? He looked different afterwards. He had changed. Mercer said, How could you see that? It's my job. He looked startled. There isn't such a job. Yes, I said, there is. Explain, he said. I watch for things that aren't what they were, and try to understand and find out why. All the time? I nodded. Yes. He drank some brandy thoughtfully. What change did you see in Sheridan? I hesitated. I just thought that things had shifted in his mind, like seeing something from a different perspective, a sort of revelation. I didn't know if it would last. It might not have done. No. He said, Mercer said, Sorry, Dad. It was my turn to stare. He said it before he went out onto the platform. Mercer swallowed with difficulty and eventually went on. He'd been so quiet. I couldn't sleep. I went out to the saloon about dawn. 
and he was sitting there. I asked him what was the matter, and he said, I fucked things up, didn't I? We all knew he had. It wasn't anything new. But it was the first time he'd said so. I tried... I, I tried to comfort him, to, to say we would stand by him no matter what. He knew about Filmer's threat, you know. Filmer said in front of all of us that he knew about the cats. He looked unseeingly over his glass. It wasn't the only time it had happened. Sheridan killed two cats like that in our garden when he was fourteen. We got therapy for him. They said it was the upheaval of adolescence. He paused. One psychiatrist said Sheridan was psychopathic. He couldn't help what he did. But he could, really, most of the time. He could help being discourteous, but he thought being rich gave him the right. I told him it didn't. Why did you send him to Cambridge? I asked. My father was there and established a scholarship. They gave it to Sheridan as thanks, as a gift. He couldn't concentrate long enough to get into a college otherwise. But then, the master of the college said they couldn't keep him, scholarship or not, and I understood. Of course they couldn't. Ah, we thought he would be all right there. We so hoped he would. They'd spent a lot of hope on Sheridan, I thought. I don't know if he meant to jump this morning when he went out on the platform, Mercer said. I don't know if it was just a, an impulse. He gave way to impulses very easily. Unreasonable impulses. Almost insane sometimes. It was seductive out there, I said. Easy to jump. Mercer looked at me gratefully. Did you feel it? Sort of. Sheridan's revelation lasted until this morning, he said. Yes, I said. I saw when I brought your tea. The waiter? He shook his head, still surprised. I'd be grateful, I said, if you don't tell anyone else about the waiter. Why not? Because most of my work depends on anonymity. My bosses don't want people like Filmer to know I exist. He nodded slowly with comprehension. I won't tell. He stood up and shook my hand. What do they pay you? he asked. I smiled. Enough. I wish Sheridan had been able to have a job. He couldn't stick at anything. Ah, I'll believe that what he did this morning was for us. Sorry, Dad. Mercer looked me in the eyes and made a simple statement, without defensiveness, without apology. I loved my son, he said. On Monday morning I went to Vancouver Station to back up George Burley and the rail company's dual inquiry into the hot box and the suicide. I was written down as T. Titmus acting crew, which amused me, and seemed to cover several interpretations. George was stalwart and forthright, with the ironic chuckles subdued to merely a gleam. He was a railwayman of some prestige, I was glad to see, who was treated with respect, if not quite deference, and his were the views they listened to. He gave the railway investigators a photograph of Johnson, and said that while he hadn't actually seen him pour liquid into the radio, he could say that it was in this man's roomette that he had awakened, bound and gagged, and he could say that it was this man who had attacked Titmus when he, Titmus, went back to plant the flares. Was that so? they asked me. Could I identify him positively? Positively, I said. They moved on to Sheridan's death. A sad business, they said. Apart from making a record of the time of the occurrence and the various radio messages, there was little to be done. The family had made no complaint to or about the railway company. Any other conclusions would have to be reached at the official inquest. Ah, oh, that wasn't too bad, eh? George said afterwards. Would you come in uniform to the races? I asked. Ah, oh, that's what you want. Yes, please. I gave him a card with directions and instructions 
and a pass cajoled from Nell to get him in through the gates. See you tomorrow, eh? I nodded. At eleven o'clock. We went our different ways, and with some reluctance but definite purpose, I sought out a doctor recommended by the hotel and presented myself for inspection. The doctor was thin, growing old, and inclined to make jokes over his half-moon glasses. Ah, he said when I'd removed my shirt. Does it hurt when you cough? It hurts when I do practically anything, as a matter of fact. Hmm. We'd better have a wee X-ray, then, don't you think? I agreed to the X-ray and waited around for ages until he reappeared with a large sheet of celluloid, which he clipped in front of a light. Well, now, he said, the good news is that we don't have any broken ribs or chipped vertebrae. Fine. I was relieved and perhaps a bit surprised. What we do have is a fractured shoulder blade. I stared at him. I didn't think that was possible. Anything's possible, he said. See that, he pointed. That's a real granddaddy of a break. Goes right across, goes right through. The bottom part of your left scapula, he announced cheerfully, is to all intents and purposes detached from the top. Hmm, oh, I said blankly. What do we do about it? He looked at me over the half-moons. Rivets, he said, might be extreme, don't you think? Heavy strapping, immobility for two weeks, that'll do the trick. What about, I said, if we do nothing at all? Will it mend? Oh, probably. Bones are remarkable, young bones especially. You could try a sling. You'd be more comfortable, though, if you let me strap your arm firmly, skin to skin, to your side and chest, under your shirt. I shook my head and said I wanted to go on a sort of honeymoon to Hawaii. People who go on honeymoons with broken bones, he said with a straight face, must be ready to giggle. I giggled there and then. I asked him for a written medical report and the X-ray and paid him for them and bore away my evidence. Stopping at a pharmacy on my way back to the hotel, I bought an elbow-supporting sling made of wide black ribbon, which I tried on for effect in the shop, and which made things a good deal better. I was wearing it when I opened my door in the evening, first to the brigadier on his arrival from Heathrow, and then to Bill Baudelaire from Toronto. Bill Baudelaire looked around the sitting-room and commented to the brigadier about the lavishness of my expense account. "'Expense account my foot,' the brigadier said, drinking my scotch. He's paying for it himself. Bill Baudelaire looked shocked. You can't let him, he said. Didn't he tell you? The brigadier laughed. Ha, 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 he's as rich as Croesus. No, he didn't tell me. He never tells anybody. He's afraid of it. Bill Baudelaire, with his carroty hair and pitted skin, looked at me with acute curiosity. Why do you do this job? he said. The brigadier gave me no time to answer. What else would you do to pass the time? Play back, gammon. Ah, this game's better. Isn't that it, Tor? This game is better, I agreed. The brigadier smiled. Although shorter than Bill Baudelaire, and older and leaner, and with fairer, thinning hair, he seemed to fill more of the room. I might be three inches taller than he, but I had the impression always of looking up to him, not down. To work, then, he suggested. Strategy, tactics, plan of attack. He'd brought some papers from England, though some were still to come, and he spread them out on the coffee table so that all of us leaning forward could see them. It was a good guess of yours, Tor, that the report on the cats was a computer printout because of its lack of headings. The master of the college had a call from Mercer Lorimore at eight this morning, it must have been midnight here, empowering him to tell us everything as you'd asked. The master gave us the name of the veterinary pathology lab he'd employed, and sent us a fax of the letter he'd received from them. Is that the same as the one in Filmer's briefcase, Tor? He pushed a paper across, and I glanced at it. Identical, except for the headings. Good. The Path Lab confirmed they kept the letter stored in their computer, but they don't know yet how anyone outside could get a printout. We're still trying. So are they. They don't like it happening. How about a list of their employees, I said, including temporary secretaries or wizard hacker office boys? Where do you get such language? the brigadier protested. He produced a sheet of names. This was the best they could do. I read the list. None of the names was familiar. 
Do you really need to know the connection? Bill Baudelaire asked. It would be neater, I said. The brigadier nodded. John Millington's working on it. We're talking to him by telephone before tomorrow's meeting. Now, the next thing, he turned to me. That conveyance you saw in the briefcase. As you suggested, we checked the number SF90155 with the land registry. He chuckled with all George Burley's enjoyment. That alone would have been worth your trip. He explained why. Bill Baudelaire said, We've got him, then, with great satisfaction. And the joint commanders-in-chief began deciding in which order they would fire off their accumulated salvos. Julius Apollo walked into a high-up private room in Exhibition Park Racecourse on Tuesday morning to sign and receive, as he thought, certification that he was the sole owner of Laurentide Ice, which would run in his name that afternoon. The room was the president of the racecourse's conference room, having a desk attended by three comfortable armchairs at one end, with a table surrounded by eight similar chairs at the other. The doorway from the passage was at midpoint between the groupings, so that one turned right to the desk, left to the conference table. A fawn carpet covered the floor, horse pictures covered the walls, soft yellow leather covered the armchairs. A cross between comfort and practicality, without windows, but with interesting spotlighting from recesses in the ceiling. When Filmer entered, both of the directors of security were sitting behind the desk, with three senior members of the Vancouver Jockey Club and the British Columbia Racing Commission seated at the conference table. They were there to give weight to the proceedings and to bear witness afterwards, but they had chosen to be there simply as observers, and they had agreed not to interrupt with questions. They would take notes, they said, and ask questions afterwards, if necessary. Three more people and I waited on the other side of a closed door, which led from the conference table end of the room into a serving pantry, and from there out again into the passage. When Filmer arrived, I went along the passage and locked the door he had come in by, and put the key in the pocket of my grey raincoat, which I wore buttoned to the neck. Then I walked back along the passage and into the serving pantry, where I stood quietly behind the others, waiting there. A microphone stood on the desk in front of the directors, with another on the conference table, both of them leading to a tape recorder. Out in the serving pantry, an amplifier quietly relayed everything that was said inside. Bill Baudelaire's deep voice greeted Filmer, invited him to sit in the chair in front of the desk, and said, You know Brigadier Caddo, of course. As the two men had glared at each other times without number, yes, he knew him. And these other gentlemen are from the Jockey Club and Racing Commission here in Vancouver. What is this? Filmer asked truculently. All I want is some paperwork, a, a formality. The Brigadier said, we are taking this opportunity to make some preliminary inquiries into some racing matters, and it seemed best to do it now, as so many of the people involved are in Vancouver at this time. What are you talking about? Filmer said. We should explain, the brigadier said smoothly, that we are recording what is said in this room this morning. This is not a formal trial or an official inquiry, but what is said here may be repeated at any trial or inquiry in the future. We would ask you to bear this in mind. Filmer said strongly, I object to this. At any future trial or jockey club inquiry, Bill Baudelaire said, you may of course be accompanied by a legal representative. We will furnish you with a copy of the tape of this morning's preliminary proceedings, which you may care to give to your lawyer. You can't do this, Filmer said. I'm not staying. When he went to the door he had entered by, he found it locked. Let me out, Filmer said furiously. You can't do this. In the serving pantry, Mercer Lorimore took a deep breath, opened the door to the conference room, went through and closed it behind him. Good morning, Julius, he said. What are you doing here? Filmer's voice was surprised, but not overwhelmingly dismayed. Tell them to give me my paper and be done with it. Sit down, Julius, Mercer said. He was speaking into the conference table microphone, his voice sounding much louder than Filmer's. Sit down by the desk. The preliminary inquiry, Mr. Filmer, the brigadier's voice said, is principally into your actions before and during and in conjunction with the journey of the race train. There was a pause, presumably a wait for Filmer to settle. 
Then the brigadier's voice again. Uh, Mr. Lorimore, may I ask you? Mercer cleared his throat. My son Sheridan, he said evenly, who died two days ago, suffered intermittently from a mental instability which led him sometimes to do bizarre and unpleasant things. There was a pause. No words from Filmer. Mercer said, To his great regret, there was uh, an incident of that sort back in May. Sheridan killed some animals. The bodies were taken from where they were found by a veterinary pathologist, who then performed private autopsies on them. He paused again. The strain was clear in his voice, but he didn't falter. You, Julius, indicated to my family on the train that you knew about this incident, and three of us, my wife Bambi, my son Sheridan, and myself, all understood during that evening that you would use Sheridan's regrettable act as leverage to get hold of my horse voting right. Filmer said furiously, That damned play! Yes, Mercer said. It put things very clearly. After Sheridan died, I gave permission to the master of my son's college, to the British Jockey Club Security Service, and to the veterinary pathologist himself, to find out how that piece of information came into your possession. We did find out, the brigadier said, and repeated what a triumphant John Millington had relayed to us less than an hour ago. It happened by chance, by accident. You, Mr. Filmer, owned a horse trained in England at Newmarket which died. You suspected poison of some sort, and insisted on a post-mortem, making your trainer arrange to have some organs sent to the path lab. The lab wrote a letter to your trainer saying there was no foreign substance in the organs, and at your request they later sent a copy of the letter to you. One of their less bright computer operators had meanwhile loaded your letter onto a very private disk which he shouldn't have used, and in some way chain-loaded it, so that you received not only a copy of your letter, but copies of three other letters besides, letters which were private and confidential. The brigadier paused. We know this is so, he said, because when one of our operators asked the lab to print out a copy for us, your own letter and the others came out attached to it, chain-loaded into the same secret document name. The pathologist, Millington had said, was in total disarray and thinking of scrapping the lab's computer for a new one. But it wasn't the computer, he said. It was a nitwit girl who apparently thought the poison inquiry on the horse was top secret also, and put it on the top secret disc. They can't sack her. She left weeks ago. Could the pathologist be prosecuted for the cover-up? The brigadier had asked. Doubtful, Millington had said, now that Sheridan's dead. Filmer's voice, slightly hoarse, came out of the loudspeaker into the pantry. This is rubbish! You kept the letter, the brigadier said. It was dynamite, if you could find who it referred to. No doubt you kept all three of the letters, though the other two didn't concern criminal acts. Then you saw one day in your local paper that Mercer Lollimore was putting up money for a new college library, and you would have had to ask only one question to find out that Mercer Lollimore's son had left that college in a hurry during May. After that you would have found that no one would say why. You became sure that the letter referred to Sheridan Lorimore. You did nothing with your information until you heard that Mercer Lorimore would be on the transcontinental race train, and then you saw an opportunity of exploring the possibility of blackmailing Mr. Lorimore into letting you have his horse voting right. You can't prove any of this, Filmer said defiantly. We all believe, said Bill Baudelaire's voice, that with you, Mr. Filmer, it is the urge to crush people and make them suffer that sets you going. We know you could afford to buy good horses. We know that for you simply owning horses isn't enough. Save me the salmon, Filmer said, and if you can't put up, shut up. Very well, the brigadier said. We'll ask our next visitor to come in, please. Daffodil Quentin, who was standing beside George in the pantry, and had been listening with parted mouth and growing anger, 
opened the dividing door dramatically and slammed it shut behind her. You unspeakable toad, her voice said vehemently over the loudspeaker. At a girl, I thought. She was wearing a scarlet dress and a wide shiny black belt and carrying a large shiny black handbag. Under the high curls and in a flaming rage, she attacked as an avenging angel in full spate. I will never give you or sell you my half of Laurentide ice, she said forcefully. And you can threaten and blackmail until you're blue in the face. You can frighten my stable lad until you think you're God Almighty. But you can't from now on frighten me. And I think you're contemptible and should be put in a zoo. Chapter 21 Bill Baudelaire, who had persuaded her to come with him to Vancouver, cleared his throat and sounded as if he were trying not to laugh. Mrs. Quentin, he said to the world at large, is prepared to testify. You bet I am, Daffodil interrupted. That you threatened to have her prosecuted for killing one of her own horses if she didn't give, give, you... Her remaining share of Laurentide ice. You used me, Daffodil said furiously. You bought your way out of the train, and you were all charm and smarm. And all you were aiming to do was ingratiate yourself with Mercer Lorimore so you could sneer at him and cause him pain and take away his horse. You make me puke. I don't have to listen to this, Vilma said. Yes, you damn well do. It's time someone told you to your face what a, a, a slimy, putrid blob of spit you are, and gave you back some of the hatred you sow. Uh, Bill Baudelaire said, We have here a, a letter from Mrs. Quentin's insurance company, written yesterday, saying that they made exhaustive tests on her horse that died of colic, and they are satisfied that they paid her claim correctly. We also have here an affidavit from the stable lad, Lenny Higgs, to the effect that you learned about the colic and the specially numbered feeds for Laurentide Ice from him during one of your early visits to the horse car. He goes on to swear that he was later frightened into saying that Mrs. Quentin gave him some food to give to her horse, who died of colic. He cleared his throat. As you have heard, the insurance company are satisfied that whatever she gave her horse didn't cause its death. Lenny Higgs further testifies that the man who frightened him by telling him he would be sent to prison where he would catch AIDS and die, that man is an ex-baggage handler once employed by VIA Rail, name of Alex Mitchell McLaughlin. What? For the first time there was fear in Filmer's voice and I found it sweet. Lenny Higgs positively identifies him from this photograph. There was a pause while Bill Baudelaire handed it over. This man traveled in the racecourse part of the train under the name of Johnson. During yesterday, the photograph was shown widely to VIA employees in Toronto and Montreal, and he was several times identified as Alex McLaughlin. There was a silence where Filmer might have spoken. You were observed to be speaking to McLaughlin. You bet you were, Daffodil interrupted. You were talking to him, arguing with him at Thunder Bay, and I didn't like the look of him. This is his picture. I identify it too. You used him to frighten Lenny, and you told me Lenny would give evidence against me, and I didn't know you'd frightened the poor boy with such a terrible threat. You told me he hated me and would be glad to tell lies about me. The enormity of it almost choked her. I don't know how you can live with yourself. I don't know how anyone can be so full of sin. Her voice resonated with the full old meaning of the word, an offence against God. It was powerful, I thought, and it had silenced Filmer completely. It may come as an, an anticlimax, the brigadier said after a pause, but we will now digress to another matter entirely one that will be the subject of a full steward's inquiry at the Jockey Club Portland Square in the near future. I refer to the ownership of a parcel of land referred to in the land registry as SF90155. 
Brigadier told me later that it was at that point that Filmer turned grey and began to sweat. This parcel of land, his military voice went on, is known as West Hillside Stables New Market. This was a stable owned by Ivor Horfitz and run by his paid private trainer in such a dishonest manner that Ivor Horfitz was barred from racing and racing stables for life. He was instructed to sell West Hillside Stables, as he couldn't set foot there, and it was presumed that he had. However, the new owner, in his turn, wants to sell, and has found a buyer. But the buyer's lawyer's searches have been very thorough, and they have discovered that the stables were never Horfitz's to sell. They belonged, and they still do legally belong to you, Mr. Filmer. There was a faint sort of groan which might have come from Filmer. That being so, we will have to look into your relationship with Ivor Horfitz and with the illegal matters that were carried on for years at West Hillside Stables. We also have good reason to believe that Ivor Horfitz's son, Jason, knows you owned the stables and were concerned in its operation, and that Jason let that fact out to his friend, the stable lad Paul Shacklebury, who, as you will remember, was the subject of your trial for conspiracy to murder, which took place earlier this year. There was a long, long silence. Daffodil's voice said, murmuring, I don't understand any of this, do you? Mercer as quietly answered, They found a way of warning him off for life. Oh, good! But it sounds so dull. Not to him, Mercer murmured. We'll now return, Bill Baudelaire's voice said more loudly, to the matter of your attempt to wreck the train. He coughed. Will you please come in, Mr. Burley? I smiled at George, who had been listening to the Horfitz part in non-comprehension, and the rest in horrified amazement. We're on, I said, removing my raincoat and laying it on a serving counter. After you. He and I, the last in the pantry, went through the door. He was wearing his grey uniform and carrying his conductor's cap. I was revealed in Tommy's grey trousers, grey and white shirt, deep yellow waistcoat and tidy striped tie. Polished, pressed, laundered, brushed. A credit to VIA rail. Julius Filmer saw the conductor and a waiter he'd hardly noticed in his preoccupation with his own affairs. The brigadier and Bill Baudelaire saw the waiter for the first time, and there was an awakening and realisation on each of their faces. Although I'd told them by now that I'd worked with the crew, they hadn't truly understood how perfect had been the bright camouflage. Oh! That's who you are! exclaimed Daffodil, who was sitting now in one of the chairs round the conference table. I, I couldn't place you outside. Mercer patted her hand, which lay on the table, and gave me the faintest of smiles over her head. The three Vancouver bigwigs took me at face value, knowing no different. Uh, would you come forward, please? Bill Baudelaire said. George and I both advanced past the conference table until we were nearer the desk. The two directors were seated behind the desk, Filmer in the chair in front of it. Filmer's neck was rigid, his eyes were dark, and the sweat ran down his temples. The conductor, George Burley, Bill Baudelaire said, yesterday gave VIA Rail an account of three acts of sabotage against the race train. Disaster was fortunately averted on all three occasions, but we believe that all these dangerous situations were the work of Alex McLaughlin, who was acting on your instructions and was paid by you. No, Filmer said dully. Our inquiries are not yet complete, Bill Baudelaire said, but we know that the VIA rail offices in Montreal were visited three or four weeks ago by a man answering in general to your description, who said he was researching for a thesis on the motivations of industrial sabotage. He asked for the names of any railroad saboteurs, so that he could interview them and see what made them tick. He was given a short list of people no longer to be employed on the railroads in any capacity. Heads would roll, the VIA rail executive had said. That list, although to be found in every railway station office in the country, should never have been given to an outsider. McLaughlin's name is on that list, Bill Baudelaire observed. Filmer said nothing. 
the realization of total disaster showed in every line of his body, in every twitch in his face. As we said, Bill Baudelaire went on, McLaughlin traveled on the train under the name of Johnson. During the first evening at a place called Cartier, he uncoupled Mr. Lorimore's private car and left it dead and dark on the track. The railroad investigators believed he waited in the vicinity to see the next train along, the regular transcontinental Canadian, come and crash into the Lorimore's car. He had always been around to watch the consequences of his sabotage in the past, acts he had been sent to prison for committing. When the race train returned to pick up the Lorimore's car, he simply reboarded and continued on the journey. He, he, he shouldn't have done it, Filmer said. Oh, we know that. We also know that in speech you continually mixed up Winnipeg with Vancouver. You instructed McLaughlin to wreck the train before Winnipeg, when you meant before Vancouver. Filmer looked dumbfounded. That's right, Daffodil said, sitting up straight. Winnipeg and Vancouver, he got them mixed up all the time. In Banff, Bill Baudelaire said, Someone loosened the drain plug on the fuel tank for the boiler that provides steam heat for the train. If it hadn't been discovered, the train would have had to go through a freezing evening in the Rockies without heat for horses or passengers. Mr. Burley, would you tell us at first hand about both of these occurrences, please? George gave his accounts of the uncoupling and the missing fuel, with a railwayman's outrage quivering in his voice. Filmer looked shrunken and sullen. During that last evening, Bill Baudelaire said, you decided to cancel your instructions to McLaughlin, and you went forward to speak to him. You had a disagreement with him. You told him to do no more, but you had reckoned without McLaughlin. He really is a perpetual saboteur. You misunderstood his mentality. You could start him off, but you couldn't stop him. You were responsible for putting him on the train to wreck it, and we will make that responsibility... Stick. Filmer began weakly to protest, but Bill Baudelaire gave him no respite. Your man, McLaughlin, he said, knocked out the conductor and left him tied up and gagged in the roomette he had been given in the name of Johnson. McLaughlin then put the radio out of order by pouring liquid into it. These acts were necessary, as he saw it, because he had already, at a place called Revelstoke, removed oily waste from the journal box holding one of the axles under the horse car. One of two things could then happen. If the train crew failed to notice the axle getting red hot, the axle would break, cause damage, possibly derail the train. If it were discovered, the train would stop for the axle to be cooled. In either case, the conductor would radio to the dispatcher in Vancouver, who would radio to the conductor of the regular train, the Canadian, coming along behind, to tell him to stop so that there shouldn't be a collision. Is that clear? It was pellucid to everyone in the room. The train crew, he went on, did discover the hot axle, and the engineers stopped the train. No one could find the conductor who was tied up in Johnson's roomette. No one could radio to Vancouver, as the radio wouldn't work. The only recourse left to the crew was to send a man back along the line to light flares to stop the Canadian in the old historic way. He paused briefly. McLaughlin, a railwoman, knew this would happen. So when the train stopped, he went himself along the track, armed himself with a piece of wood, and lay in wait for whoever came with the flares. Filmer stared darkly, hearing it for the first time. McLaughlin attacked the man with the flares, but by good fortune failed to knock him out. It was this man here, who was sent with the flares. He nodded in my direction. He succeeded in lighting the flares and stopping the Canadian. He paused and said to me, Is that correct? Yes, sir, I said. Word perfect, I thought. He went on. The race train engineers cooled the journal box with snow and refilled it with oil, and the train went on its way. The conductor was discovered in Mr. McLaughlin's roomette. McLaughlin did not reboard the train that time, and there will presently be a warrant issued for his arrest. You, Mr. Filmer, are answerable with McLaughlin for what happened. I, I told him not to, 
Hilma's voice was a rising shout of protest. I, I, I didn't want him to. His lawyers would love that admission, I thought. McLaughlin's assault was serious, Bill Baudelaire said calmly. He picked up my X-ray and the doctor's report and waved them in Filmer's direction. McLaughlin broke this crewman's shoulder blade. The crewman has positively identified McLaughlin as the man who attacked him. The conductor has positively identified McLaughlin as the passenger known to him as Johnson. The conductor has suffered concussion, and we have here another doctor's report on that. No doubt a good defence lawyer might have seen gaps in the story, but at that moment Filmer was beleaguered and confounded and hampered by the awareness of guilt. He was past thinking analytically, past asking how the crewman had escaped from McLaughlin and been able to complete his mission, past wondering what was conjecture with the sabotage and what was provable fact. The sight of Filmer reduced to sweating rubble was the purest revenge that any of us, Mercer, Daffodil, Val Catto, Bill Baudelaire, George Burley, or I, could have envisaged, and we had it in full measure. Do unto others, I thought dryly, what they have done to your friends. We will proceed against you on all counts, the brigadier said magisterially. Control disintegrated in Firma. He came up out of his chair, fighting mad, driven to lashing out, to raging against his defeat, to pushing someone else for his troubles, even though it could achieve no purpose. He made me his target. It couldn't have been a subconscious awareness that it was I who had been his real enemy all along, much the reverse, I supposed, in that he saw me as the least of the people there, the one he could best bash with most impunity. I saw him coming a mile off. I also saw the alarm on the brigadier's face and correctly interpreted it. If I fought back, as instinct dictated, if I did to Filmer the sort of damage I'd told the brigadier I'd done to McLaughlin, I would weaken our case. Thought before action, if one had time. Thought could be flash-fast. I had time. It would be an unexpected bonus for us if the damage were the other way round. He had iron-pumping muscle power. It would indeed be damage. Oh, well. I rolled my head a shade sideways, and he punched me twice, quite hard, on the cheek and the jaw. I went back with a crash against the nearby wall, which wasn't all that good for the shoulder blade, and I slid the bottom of my spine down the wall until I was sitting on the floor, knees bent up, my head back against the paintwork. Filmer was above me, lunging about and delivering another couple of stingingly heavy cuffs, and I thought, come on, guys, it's high time for the arrival of the cavalry. And the cavalry, the Mounties, in the shape of George Burley and Bill Baudelaire, obligingly grabbed Filmer's swinging arms and hauled him away. I stayed where I was, feeling slightly popped, watching the action. The brigadier pressed a button on the desk, which soon resulted in the arrival of two large racecourse security guards, one of whom, to Filmer's furious astonishment, placed a manacle upon the Julius Apollo wrist. You can't do this! he shouted. The guard phlegmatically fastened the hanging half of the metal bracelet to his own thick wrist. One of the Vancouver top brass spoke for the first time in an authoritative voice. Take Mr. Filmer to the security office and detain him until I come down. The guard said, Yes, sir. They moved like tanks. Filmer, humiliated to his socks, was tugged away between them as if of no account. One might almost have felt sorry for him if one hadn't remembered Paul Shacklebury and Ezra Gideon, for whom he had had no pity. Daffodil Quentin's eyes were stretched wide open. She came over and looked down at me with compassion. You poor boy, she said, horrified. How perfectly dreadful! Mr. Burley, Bill Baudelaire said smoothly, would you be so kind as to escort Mrs. Quentin for us? If you turn right in the passage, you'll find some double doors ahead of you. Through there is the reception room where the passengers and the other owners from the train are gathering for cocktails and lunch. Would you take Mrs. Quentin there? We'll look after this crewman, get him some help, and we would be pleased if you uh, could yourself stay for lunch. George said to me, 
Are you all right, Tommy? And I said, Yes, George. And he chuckled with kind relief and said it would be a pleasure, eh, to stay for lunch. He stood back to let Daffodil lead the way out of the far door, and when she reached there she paused and looked back. The poor boy, she said again. Julius Wilmer's a beast. The Vancouver Jockey Club men rose and made courteous noises of sympathy in my direction, said they would hand Filmer on to the police with a report of the assault, said we would no doubt be needed to make statements later. They then followed Daffodil, as they were the hosts of the party. When they'd gone, the brigadier switched off the machine that had recorded every word. Poor boy, my foot, he said to me. You chose to let him hit you. I saw you. I smiled a little ruefully, acknowledging his perception. Ah, oh, he couldn't, Mercer protested, drawing near. No one could just let himself be. He could, and he did. The brigadier came round from behind the desk. Quick thinking. Brilliant. But, but why? Mercer said. To tie the slippery Mr. Filmer in tighter knots. The brigadier stood in front of me, put a casual hand down to mine, and pulled me to my feet. Did you truly? Mercer said to me in disbelief. Hmm. I nodded and straightened a bit, trying not to wince. Don't worry about him, the brigadier said. He used to ride bucking broncos and God knows what else. The three of them stood, as in a triumvirate, looking at me in my uniform as if I'd come from a different planet. I sent him on the train, the brigadier said, to stop Filmer doing whatever he was planning. He smiled briefly. Sort of match. Two-horse race. Well, it seems to have been neck and neck now and then, Mercer said. The brigadier considered it. Maybe. But our runner had the edge. Mercer Lorimore and I watched the races from a smaller room next to the large one where the reception was taking place. We were in the racecourse president's private room, to which he could retire with friends if he wanted to, and it was furnished accordingly in extreme comfort and soft turquoise and gold. The president had been disappointed but understanding, that Mercer felt he couldn't attend the lunch party so soon after his son's death, and had offered this room instead. Mercer had asked if I might join him. So he and I drank the President's champagne, and looked down from his high window to the track far below, and talked about Filmer mostly. I liked him, you know, Mercer said wonderingly. Well, he can be charming. Bill Baudelaire tried to warn me at Winnipeg, he said. But I wouldn't listen. I really thought that his trial had been a travesty and that he was innocent. He told me about it himself. He, he said he didn't bear the jockey club any malice. I smiled. Extreme malice, I said. He threatened them to their faces that he would throw any available spanner into their international works. McLaughlin was some spanner. Mercer sat down in one of the huge armchairs. I stayed standing by the window. Why was Filmer prosecuted, he asked, if there was such a poor case? There was a cast-iron case, I said. Filmer sent a particularly vicious frightener to intimidate all four prosecution witnesses, and the cast-iron became splinters. This time, this morning, we thought we'd stage a sort of preliminary trial, at which the witnesses couldn't have been reached, and have it all on record in case anyone retracted afterwards. He looked at me skeptically. Did you think I could be intimidated? I assure you I can't. Not any more. After pause, I said, You have Xanthi. Ezra Gideon had daughters and grandchildren. One of the witnesses in the Paul Shacklebury case backed away because of what she was told would happen to her sixteen-year-old daughter if she gave evidence. Dear God, he said, dismayed. Surely he'll be sent to prison. Well, he were warned off anyhow, and that's what he wants least. He had Paul Shacklebury killed to prevent it. I think we will have got rid of him from racing, for the rest. We'll have to see what the Canadian police and VIA rail can do, and hope they'll find McLaughlin. Let McLaughlin not be eaten by a bear, I thought. And he hadn't been. 
He was picked up for stealing tools from a railway yard in Edmonton a week later, and subsequently convicted with Filmer of the serious ancient offence of attempted train wrecking, chiefly on the evidence of a temporary crew member in his VIA rail clothes. VIA put me on their personnel list retroactively and shook my hand. Filmer was imprisoned despite his defence that he had not given specific instructions to McLaughlin on any account and had tried to stop him before the end. It was proved that he had actively recruited a violent saboteur. Any later possible change of mind was held to be irrelevant. Filmer never did find out that I wasn't a waiter, because it wasn't a question his lawyers ever thought to ask, and it went much against him with the jury that he'd violently attacked a defenceless rail employee without provocation in front of many witnesses, even though he knew of the broken scapula. The brigadier kept a straight face throughout. It worked a treat, he said afterwards. Wasn't Daffodil Quentin a trooper, convincing them the poor boy had been brutally beaten for no reason except that he'd saved them all from being killed in their beds? Ah, lovely stuff. It made nonsense of the change of heart defence. They couldn't wait to find Filmer guilty after that. McLaughlin, in his turn, swore that I'd nearly murdered him out on the track. I said he'd tripped and knocked himself out on the rails. McLaughlin could produce no X-rays and wasn't believed to his fury. Broken bone or not, that waiter can fight like a goddamn tiger, he said. No way could Filmer beat him up. Filmer, however, had done so. It had been seen and was a fact. On the Tuesday of the Jockey Club race train stakes at Exhibition Park, with the trial still months ahead, and the feel of Filmer's fists a reality, not a memory, the racecourse president came into his private room to see Mercer and me, and to show us that if we drew the curtains along the right-hand side wall, we could see into the reception room. They can't see into here, he said. It's one-way glass. He pulled strings and revealed the party. I hear the meeting went well this morning, except for the end. He looked at me questioningly. Mr. Lorimore and Bill Baudelaire asked that you be treated as a most honoured guest. But shouldn't you be resting? No point, sir, I said. And I wouldn't miss the great race for anything. Through the window one could fascinatingly see all the faces grown so familiar during the past ten days. The Unwins, the Ready Hots, the Youngs. If I might ask you, I said, ask the world, according to Bill Baudelaire and Brigadier Cato. I smiled. Not the world. That young woman over there in the grey suit, with the fair hair and a plait and a worried expression. Nell Richmond, Mercer said. Would you mind if she came in here for a while? Not in the least, the President said, and within minutes could be seen talking to her. He couldn't have told her who to expect in his room, though, because when she came in and saw me she was surprised, and, I had to think, joyful. You're on your feet. Daffodil said the waiter was hurt badly. Her voice died away, and she swallowed. I was afraid that we wouldn't get to Hawaii. Oh! It was a sound somewhere between a laugh and a sob. I don't think I like you. Try harder. Well, she opened her handbag and began to look inside it, and glanced up and saw all the people next door. How great, she said to Mercer. You're both with us, even if you're not. She produced a folded piece of paper and gave it to me. I have to go back to sort out the lunch places. I didn't want her to go. I said... Nell, and heard it sound too full of anxiety, too full of plain physical battering, but it was past calling back. Her face changed, the games died away. Read that when I've gone, she said, and I'll be there, through the glass. She went out of the President's room without looking back, and soon reappeared among the others. I unfolded the paper slowly, not wanting it to be bad news and found it was a telex. It said, Richmond, Four Seasons Hotel, Vancouver. Confirm your two weeks vacation starting immediately. Mary, have a good time. I closed my eyes. Is that despair? Mercer said. I opened my eyes. The telex still read the same way. 
I handed it to him, and he read it also. I dare say, he said ironically, that Val Cato will match this. If he doesn't, I'll resign. We spent the afternoon companionably, and watched the preliminary races with the interest of devotees. When it was time for the jockey club race train stakes, Mercer decided that, Sheridan or not, he would go down to see voting rights saddled, as he could go and return by express elevator to our Erie to watch the race. When he'd gone, and the room next door had mostly emptied, I looked down on the flags and the banners and the streamers and balloons and the razzmatazz with which Exhibition Park had met the challenge of Assini Boyer Downs and Woodbine, and thought of all that had happened on the journey across Canada, and I wondered whether I would find flat footing round British racecourses in the rain a relaxation or a bore, wondered if I would go on doing it, thought that time would show me the way, as it always had. I thought of Mrs. Baudelaire, whom I would never meet, and wished she could have watched this next race, thought of Aunt Viv with gratitude. Mercer came back, looking happy, happier in a peaceful way, as if he'd settled ghosts. Daffodil is amazing, he said. She's down there, holding court, kissing Laurentide eyes, laughing, on top of the world. There seems to be no difficulty in the horse running, even though half still presumably belongs to Filmer. It's in Daffodil's name on the race card, I said. Oh, so it is. And the Youngs? Rose and Cumber, with Sparrowgrass, and uh, the people with Ready Hot? Ha! It's like a club down there. They were pleased, they said, that I had come. They genuinely would be, I thought. The party was incomplete without Mercer. There was a large television set in the President's room, through which one could hear the bugles preceding the runners to the track, and hear crowd noises and the commentary. Nothing like being down near the action, but better than silence. The race was being broadcast live throughout Canada, and recorded for the rest of the world, and there was a long spiel going on about the growing international flavour of Canadian racing, and how the great transcontinental mystery race train had awakened enormous interest everywhere, and was altogether a good thing for Canada. Mercer, who had been prepared to do a lot for Canadian racing, watched voting right lead the pre-race parade the horse on the screen appearing larger to us than the real one far down on the track. He's looking well, he told me. I do hope, he stopped. I think he may be the best of all my horses, the best to come. But he may not be ready today. It's perhaps too soon. Sparagrass's favorite. It'd be nice for the youngs. We watched Sparagrass prance along in his turn. Cumber Young has found out it was Filmer who bought, or took, Ezra Gideon's horses. If Cumber had been up here this morning, he'd have torn Filmer limb from limb, and been in trouble himself, I said. As Filmer is now? Yes, roughly speaking. Rough is the word. He looked at me sideways, but made no further comment. Watch the horses, I said mildly. Not the lumps that were swelling. With a wry twitch of the lips, he turned his attention back to Reddy Hot, who looked fit to scorch the dirt, and to Laurentide Ice, the colour of his name. Nine of the ten runners had travelled on the train. The tenth was a local Vancouver horse, bought by the Unwins for the occasion. Not as good a prospect as Upper Gumtree, but the Unwins had wanted to take their part in the climax. All of the owners, and Nell, precious Nell, came to watch the race in the glassed-in part of the stands, slanting down in front of the window of the President's room, so that it was over their excited heads that Mercer and I saw the horses loaded into the stalls and watched the flashing colours sprint out. All the way across Canada, Mercer said as if to himself, for the next two minutes. All the way across Canada, I thought, in worry and love and grief for his son. Voting right shot out of the gate and took a strong lead. Mercer groaned quietly. Oh, he's running away. Laurentide Ice and Sparrowgrass next weren't in a hurry but kept a good pace going, their heads together, not an inch in it. Behind them came five or six in a bunch, 
with Ready Hot Last. The sing-song commentary on the television read off the time of the first quarter mile covered by voting right. Too fast, Mercer groaned. At the half mile, voting right was still in front, still going at high speed, ahead by a full twenty lengths. Ah, oh, it's hopeless, Mercer said. He'll blow up in the home stretch. He's never been ridden this way before. Didn't you discuss it with the jockey? I just wished him luck. He knows the horse. Or maybe the horse has been inspired by the train travel, I said flippantly. To come all this way, Mercer said, taking no notice. Oh, well, that's racing. He hasn't exactly blown up yet, I pointed out. Voting right was far in front, going down the back stretch a good deal faster than the race train had gone through the Rockies. And he didn't know he was going too fast, he simply kept on going. The jockeys on Sparrowgrass, Laurentide Ice, Ready Hot and the others, left their move on the leader until they'd come round the last bend and spread out across the track to give themselves a clear run home. Then... Laurentide Ice melted away, as Mrs. Baudelaire had said he would, and Ready Hot produced a spurt, and Sparrowgrass, with determination, began to close at last on voting right. He's going to lose, Mercer said despairingly. It looked like it. One couldn't say for certain, but his time was too fast. Voting right kept right on going. Sparrowgrass raced hard to the finish, but it was voting right as Mrs. Baudelaire had predicted, voting right who had the edge, who went floating past the post in a record time for the track. The best horse Mercer would ever own. The target kept safe from Filmer. Sheridan lay in untroubled eternity. And who was to say that Mercer wasn't right? That in his impulsive way the son hadn't died to give his father this moment? Mercer turned towards me, speechless brimming to overflowing with inexpressible emotion, wanting to laugh, wanting to cry, like all owners at the fulfilment of a dreamed-of success. The sheen in his eyes was the same the world over, the love of the flying thoroughbred, the perfection of winning a great race. He found his voice, looked at me with awakening humour and a good deal of understanding. Thank you, he said. Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and we hope you enjoyed listening to your audiobook.